It's a brilliant new day of Thursday is born and here we are serving you as we always do right here on the AM show. My name is Benjamin Akakwa. I always do this together with Christiana Sweetie Abochi. Thank you for your company. Now coming up this morning, I'll be letting you know what will be coming your way. But before that, lest I forget my proverb for you this morning. And it is simply this, a very simple one. Obi nima, obi tre. Obi nima, obi Tre. Uh, the other day, I shared with you another Obinim uh, one. Um, Obinim Obrimpo Ashasye. But today, Obinima Obitre. In simple terms, if one person doesn't know, someone else will teach the person. It also points to the fact that no one person is the repository, the fountain of all knowledge. No matter how much you know, someone knows more than you do or knows something you do not know. And that's why all of us ought to be humble all the time. Because no matter what, you will need that other person someday. No matter what. And that's my proverb for you this morning. Ubi nima, ubi tre. Well, let's settle for what you can expect on the show now. The news followed by the news review today. The NDC's parliamentary candidate for the Efutu constituency, James Kofi Annan, is our guest. And after that, of course, we'll veer into sports. Mubarak Haruna will bring us that. And then in the big stories, AM exclusive today, we have a very special guest. He is a former UN senior governance advisor, and he's in the person of Professor Bafo Ajimandia. He'll be joining us for a, an incisive uh, conversation. We're going to go surgical on governance issues, politics, among others. You want to stay for that conversation. But also coming up, as we heard yesterday, the Supreme Court has dismissed an application for an injunction against uh, the process of accepting uh, the nominees or vetting, approving the ministerial nominees of President Akufuad. Now, the application filed by South Dine legislator uh, Roxanne Nelson Dafiamipo was deemed frivolous and an abuse of court processes by the Apex Court. There were some interesting developments as far as the Chief Justice uh, is concerned. We'll bring you more on this later on the show as we engage some legal luminaries. But also on the show, our Hineyiri Gifty Auntie. Oh, you know her, right? Yes, definitely. It's been a while where she, she's on a campaign to feed some 2,000 underprivileged children in the central and eastern regions this Easter. We'll be sharing with you what this noble project is about and how you can help make this a reality for not just her, but those 2,000 uh, people who would be so grateful to benefit from that package this Easter. That's what we're looking forward to on the AM show. But stay with us up next, AM News. Welcome aboard the AM News. Let's settle for the details of our stories now. In our first story, the Methodist Church of Ghana is asking the Electoral Commission to ensure fairness and neutrality throughout the pre- and post-stages of the upcoming general election uh, to ensure peace prevails, imploring political parties and independent candidates to refrain from using inflammatory and abusive language during their campaigns. Presiding Bishop, Most Reverend Dr. Paul Kwabnabwafo said, all hands had to be on deck to protect the peace we enjoyed as a country. We all started this journey together and uh, we sent our proposals to the body that is to take our laws and see to what is good for us as a nation. The churches, the as we approach the general elections, in December 2024, let us all resolve to eschew tendencies that will tend to compromise the peace of the country before, during, and after the elections. In that regard, it is incumbent upon all the stakeholders in the process to be minded in their duty to the state. To the Electoral Commission, it must be manifestly seen to be a fair and neutral umpire in all the processes leading to, during, and importantly, after the elections. The security personnel 
they should be professional and impartial judges to engender trust in the electoral process. To our political parties and independent candidates, they should be measured in their communication and engagement, embracing inclusive language and avoiding intemperate, abusive, and offensive language in their campaigns. To the media, as always, we will call on you because you are very significant and play a role. You have to avoid sensational reportage, providing and using your platforms to create avenues for peace. In the spirit of peace, In our next story, a leader and founder of the New Force Movement, Nana Kwame Bediako, has disclosed his vision of expanding Ghana's agricultural sector through the use of modern machinery and irrigation systems. A move, he says, would boost the local economy as well as create jobs for the teeming unemployed youth. He made the statement in Tichiman during his tour of the Bono East region, where he spoke against the monetization of Ghana's politics, adding that the current situation was likely to be breed corruption. And as Abit has more in this report. With a new energy, the leader and founder of the new force, Nana Kwame Bidiako, stormed the Bono East region as part of his listening tour of the 16 regions across the country. The businessman turned politician in his address to the hundreds of party sympathizers in Tichiman disclosed his vision of expanding the agri sector through the use of technological advancements as a means of boosting food production. I think that we have to apply industrial support. Okay, if we're doing 100 acres, we should simply find a way to do 10,000 hectares. And that's when we're going to need a lot of equipment and a lot of irrigation systems. Because you can't use humans to water that. You will need industrial power to water that. Therefore, you need to advance your irrigation system. And then the fertilizing system as well. You need to create speed in it. So there are things that can grow in maybe it's three months now, but we can advance it to two months. And then after that, we go into processing. He says this development would go a long way to create jobs as the move would complement processing, which involves the creation of new industries. The processing as well would help us to have supplying power, distribution power, Demand will come from this area because once you're able to do the distribution, then you're able to keep supplying because there will be demand. And I think that that side of distribution, you will see that it will create jobs for logistics. And even apart from that, there will be the potential aspect of using technology to also support the entire industrial platform of expanding agriculture. Once we start to process our food, we will be more healthy and we will still make more money out of it. Sheda, as he's affectionately called by his supporters, vehemently spoke against the monetization of Ghana's politics, adding that the current situation breeds corruption. Well, I just think for me, it's the definition of stupidity that, you know, you come, you pay bribes, the people who are receiving the bribes who are happy and then when you finish you take yours you rob them and the same people who take bribes are angry it's um, a chase of wind we're just spinning ourselves around as a citizen i don't want to be a citizen and be part of such thinkers that's why i have formed the new force because i want the new people with new mentality all of this is demonstration of knowledge demonstration of wisdom how we utilize that and not use money to play the game of autocracy, democracy, and all that crazy, crazy craziness. Then Kwame Bidiakon says the rising cost of living do not correspond with the earnings of the citizenry, hence the struggles on the streets. I think that people are undervalued. I think people are paid minimum salary, but the economy is demanding so much from one person that they have no choice, but they have to be corrupt because the value is too small for a citizen and the electricity is high, the water bill is high, the school fees, the transportation, 
all of these things. So we, we are like prisoners now. We are like prisoners, but we're also human beings. And I think that we deserve better, a better governance. There were questions from the crowd. There were cheers from the team in youth. And there was a song actually created in honor of the man, Saji Funana Kwame Bidiakon, also known as Shedda. Masabit, join us. The Minister of State for Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development, Osei Bonsu Amwa, has indicated that the Gulf of Guinea Northern Region's Social Cohesion Pro Project has created more than 3,500 jobs for community members through participation in the construction of facilities in the project areas. He says the project has also strengthened the capacity of more than 4,000 program actors within that area. Obi Amwa has been speaking at the Soko Conference in Tamale. The SOCO project is aimed at contributing to the prevention of conflict spillover from the Sahel regions by improving the socio and economic resilience of the northern regions in the Gulf of Guinea countries. In Ghana, the project is being implemented in six regions and 48 metropolitan municipal and district assemblies. Mr. Osei Bunso Amwa said the SOCO project was complementing government's development agenda. The SOCO project is complementing the government's development agenda and the interventions are consistent with our socioeconomic development policies, especially regarding the pillars of peace and security, economic growth, and social development. It is worth noting that out of the system project indicator targets, 13 of them have been exceeded, indicating an enormous progress towards the achievement of the project development objectives. Some of these achievements include the construction and rehabilitation of 582 sub projects in the first year, consisting of 42 rooms, 66 classroom blocks, and teachers' accommodation. 74 rural markets, 55 health facilities, 228 water facilities, including mechanized bubbles, bubbles with hand pump, and small town water systems, among others. Now, Upper West Regional Director of Health, uh, Dr. Damien Pungwiri, says uh, malaria still constitutes about 28% of outpatient department attendance in the region. However, deaths resulting from malaria have decreased from 28 to 6 uh, percent per latest uh, statistics. This he attributed partly to the indoor residue spraying embarked on by the Anglo-Gold Ashanti Malaria Control Ghana and other interventions by the Ghana Health Service. Rafiq Salam has more. The one-day stakeholders meeting organized by Anglo Gold Asante Malaria Control Ghana, Agamal, is aimed to emphasize the need for continuous improvement in the indoor residual spraying IRS program in the Upper West Zone. The meeting is also aimed to review the 2023 round of IRS activities and discuss the way forward for the 2024 spray campaign. Agamal has been operating indoor residual spraying in the Upper West region in partnership with the Ghana Health Service since 2012. The organization's goal is to combat malaria in communities and further reduce malaria mortality in the region. On the sidelines of the meeting, head of programs for Agamal, Malik Kofi Hassan, noted that they began spraying in the region when malaria prevalence was over 50 percent. He reiterated their commitment to eliminate malaria in the region and assure the public that insecticides that are used for the spraying are not harmful to their health. Currently, as we speak, we've been able to bring it down to about 11%, which is a very positive impact to the people uh, in their lives. And we hope to make sure that we eliminate malaria completely in the Upper West region. In the first place, we, we, we don't get you out for a day. 
we only ask you to stay out for about two hours. And again, the insecticide that we are using is not harmful to their health. It is beneficial to them, and therefore we look out to the benefit that they derive after the rooms have been sprayed. Gapa was regional director of health services. Dr. Damien Pui revealed that deaths resulting from malaria have significantly decreased from around 28 to 18 and further down to 6 last year. Currently, as I speak, <coughs> malaria still constitutes about 28% of OPD attendance in the upper west region. However, when we look at the deaths resulting from malaria, we have made significant progress. We move from around 28 down to 18, and as of last year, all deaths due to malaria came down to just six. And that is uh, something that we all have to celebrate. But we shall not relent in our efforts to eliminate malaria from Ghana. Now, government statistician uh, Professor Samuel Kobina Enim says the fight against corruption in the country will continue to be a mirage if the country's institutions are not adequately resourced to enhance the fight. According to him, the fight against corruption is being looked at from only one perspective without adequately exhausting the pull and push factors, including sal salary levels of employees. He was speaking at the 2024 Biennial Social Conference of the University of Education, Winneba. There's more in this report. The conversation around corruption has been so intense that we look at it from only one side rather than the resourcefulness of institutions. I am told that at some point, one of our former presidents said, the government pretends to be paying public servants and the public servants pretend to be working. How resourceful are institutions so that gradually we can get them to move away from this practice? Professor Samuel Kobina Enim speaking about the country's approach to fighting corruption and how the fight could be enhanced. He entreated the academics to influence policy with their research and build data repositories that would make their research relevant to the needs of society. The pull and push factors of corruption and building complementary data series which I talked about. This is the time for us as an academic community to take our different policy documents, don't evaluate it from a subjective point of view, evaluate it from the statistical target point of view. And there are very basic things you can do based on that. Did they have statistical targets in there? The numbers in there, can you associate with the numbers in there based on data that sits with your own university, data that sits in other national statistical spaces? Were those targets realistic? Were we able to achieve those targets? Now, the University of Cape Coast has partnered some German technical universities to deepen the entrepreneurship drive in their students before such students graduate from university. Statistics indicate that more than 100,000 students graduate from the country's tertiary institutions every year. But such persons are unable to secure jobs after school. Director of Academic Planning and Quality Assurance at the University of Cape Coast, Professor Daniel Ejapon, says the business challenge is to provide the students with startups and other links that would resource them before graduation. Graduate unemployment has become a thieving problem for the country. Many students who graduate from the country's tertiary institutions hardly find employment opportunities. Under this project, the students make pitches and the pitches are accepted and supported to become viable employment avenues for the students. The Director for Academic Planning and Quality Assurance at the University of Cape Coast and team member of the project, Professor Daniel Japon says the invitation of the pitches from the students is to make them create their own jobs even before they exit school. This program has been put in place just to ensure that while students are in school, they come up with some innovative ideas. And these ideas, they eventually, uh, with support, would be able to start up something for themselves and not to wait for government for, you know, uh, for jobs that sometimes may not exist. 
So basically, students come up with their ideas, and then they pitch these ideas. And there are some um, guidance and also um, some cash prizes. Of course, this year, out of the 14 students or student groups that pitched, we were able to only award our two students, our two groups. Even for those who did not actually win, they had a means, you know, of guiding them. But for those who win, uh, we now attach them to mentors and coaches that will support them uh, through the process. And even for those who didn't win, uh, there are provisions now uh, to help and coach them and mentor them to improve upon their ideas and also prepare them for other, you know, other funding uh, opportunities. The reps of the universities from Germany that are partnering the challenge have been speaking with Joy News. We come from a technical university in Germany. We want to support technical startups, technical ideas here in Ghana. We really wanted to have was social impact, seeing like that the idea had like a lot of impact on society, but it was also scalable, so not just on a very you know local level, but could reach the whole of Africa. Staying on the educational trajectory, uh, the Ashasi University has announced the rollout of new initiatives aimed at supporting graduates to launch their startups. The initiatives are uh, tailored to cater to the interests of alumni at various stages of their entrepreneurial journeys, encompass a wide range of support services and resources. One of the flagship programs is the establishment of a startup incubator, providing alumni with access to dedicated spaces, mentorship, and funding opportunities to nurture their business ideas into viable ventures. Rejoice Semifak Pesu uh, has more in this report. Complementing the incubator program are entrepreneurship workshops, training sessions, and networking events designed to equip alumni with the essential skills knowledge and connections needed to navigate the challenges of starting and scaling up a business. Additionally, the university is offering access to funding and investment opportunities, legal and administrative support, as well as marketing and branding assistance to help alumni effectively launch and grow their startups. Associate Professor at Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, Gordon Adams says, the Venture Incubator aims to catalyze innovation and create job opportunities to ease the unemployment rates in the country. Um, Ashesi is set up to educate ethical entrepreneurial leaders um, with the courage to transform the continent. So we are always looking at ways in which we can support our students to um, gain entrepreneurial interest and also to, uh, when they graduate, either start businesses or um, do things entrepreneurially when they join large companies in industry. So we wanted to understand the impact that the education, or we call it exp the experiential education that we're giving them, wanted to understand how it was impacting or um, make how it was influencing their entrepreneurial actions, whether as startup founders or as employees in um, companies. And we're doing this with McGill University. Right, so um, there are a couple of findings, but the one that's standing out for us that we're talking about here today is how we support alumni that have been out of school for uh, long, five to seven years. At Ashesi, we have a venture incubator, the Ashesi Venture Incubator, that supports graduating students and recent alumni to um, test, do a market research, and, and sort of uh, incubate their ideas for a year as part of, the, uh, as part of their national service. Um, but when we conducted the research, it was clear to us that there were a lot of alumni who were employed in industry, in large companies, with entrepreneurial ideas that were waiting to start. The university is embarking on this ambitious initiative together with other public universities to support its alumni in their entrepreneurial endeavors. Some global research, some work uh, published in the Harvard Business Review also tells us 
that the average age of a successful entrepreneur is 45, not 22, right? Like we think. So it was clear to us that there's a gap there that um, universities, including ours, should probably do more to support entrepreneurs that have been out for long, five, seven, ten years. And it didn't look like there were any programs existing currently that were supporting, that, that do that. And so we, we've brought a number of universities together. We have Ken, UST, UMAT, UCC, um, a number of, uh, University of Ghana Business School, a number of other um, organizations that do entrepreneurial training, MEST, and so forth, to really interrogate this question. How can such institutions, of course, working with partners in industry, build programs that support people who have had some entrepreneurial education or have uh, experiential education that's supposed to predispose them to startups? Rejoice Semifa Pesu's report for Joy News. And that's the note on which we cap off the news. But stay with us up next to the news review with James Kofi Annan. He is the NDC's parliamentary candidate for Efutu. We'll be right back. Welcome back on the AM show. Time now for us to get into the news review. And as always, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helping us bring you this segment. And here's what they're offering you. As always, if you're a man, prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening for free. Just make your way to any of their branches. Fortunately, they are dotted across the country. Let's start with here in Accra. They are at Spintex opposite the Shell Signboard in Kumasi, Kronomabwehia, behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takra Dianaji State. Tema, Community 22, Techi Manhanswa, and Asiya Manzama. Their call lines 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. But just the start of the news review, and um, in the next um, 30 minutes thereabouts, we'll be having an engagement with the NDC's parliamentary candidate for Ifutu, James Kofian, and he is our guest as we get into the newspapers. It's a bit of a dry morning, but that doesn't mean a paucity of issues to discuss because there's a plethora of them. James, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for joining us in the studio. How is it, Futu? When, when last was it, were you in the constituency? Um, um, thank you and uh, good morning to your viewers. Uh, Futu is doing very well. I, I mean, ordinarily should be doing very well. Uh, we have some issues that we are grappling with. I'm sure you heard in the news how uh, mining was going to take place near our only source of drinking water in, in the constituency. I used to Re recently, you, was it a demonstration or you masked up uh, people and you were there protesting that you didn't want Yeah, to... yeah. I took newsmen around to mm. see for themselves the land that uh, uh, the applicants, that the green resources was uh, going to mine on. Mm. and how close it was to the river itself. You know, the Ayusu River, as I said, is the only source of uh, drinking water for the entire Ifutu constituency, as far as the Gumua constituencies. We have three Gumua constituencies. And that is where the Ghana Water Company takes its source, mm. pumps the water to the treatment plant to be distributed to all the towns and, and villages in those constituencies. It is the same river that the farmers also use to irrigate the, their farms. They have a lot of farms around the river and they operate it all year round. So that is their source of irrigation. The river is also used as fishing, source of fishing by some of the fishermen as well as even the farmers. And we believe that, uh, that this river that serves such a useful purpose, we cannot allow mining to take place there because you know the dangerous chemicals that miners use 
in washing their uh, their product. And so if we allow it to happen, then the, all the chemicals will go into the water and will not be able to um, drink the water any longer. And it will also affect the fishes that are under the water, and it means that the fishermen are not going to be able to, to fish. Um, the river also has its estuary in Winneba, which means that it, it's, it's at Winneba that, that that Ayusu River joins the sea. Right. So if it is polluted, then it's also going to pollute the sea. And we know already the pollution situation of our seas. So, um, you know, it's, it, there's no way we should allow such a thing to happen close to the Ayusu River. Mm. Interesting developments there. I, I definitely knew that mining would be one of the things you would uh, like to talk about. But let's talk about, I mean, you started by saying that Ifutu was doing very well. If, it, if Ifutu is doing very well, uh, then you should probably be letting Alexander Afinio marking continue, right? On the electoral front and voters, uh, what are your concerns? Well, you see, uh, when I say Ifutu is doing well, the people are resilient. The spirit of the people uh, it's high, the, regardless of all the challenges. You know, un unemployment situation in Ifutu is very, very high. And so um, I cannot see that the Ifutu is doing well in terms of people's pocket income. And poverty is very high. That's why we have human trafficking situation all over the constituency. Uh, unfortunately... Oh, we do? Oh, yes. Is we, that right? Human trafficking is... Uh, Ifutu is one of the most endemic when it comes to human trafficking. And you know, that's the work I have been doing for so many years. Mm. It's the reason, uh, myself being a victim of the situation. Right. A lot of children... I mean, your story I know, but I didn't know that it was still such a problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's endemic. Situation. Yes, it is. I mean, of course, we have, had, we have made progress over the years because of interventions, of course, my involvement and all of that. Mm. But it's still a situation that needs to be tackled. And it's still a situation that needs to be tackled through proper employment programs that right. will make the people um, self-reliance, have income for themselves, and you know, avoid poverty, be able to afford education, take their children to school, etc. So that is what um, if we do. But I'm sure you might have heard the news. Um, yesterday, there was a press conference in uh, Gumwa East. Uh, in Desmond Petus, Honorable Desmond Petus constituency, of constituents who were angered by MPP coming to the constituency to recruit people in waiting for the Electoral Commission's uh, registration process. So they should come and register or transfer their vote to a Futu constituency and vote for the MPP. There was uh, actually uh, a press conference. They, they, so this is what, an allegation? It's not, okay, so the people It is an allegation, right? It's, it's an allegation, but the people themselves who were affected, who were contacted, were the ones who heard the press conference. And I've sent some of the videos to your production team. They themselves said, people were saying, I was contacted. I was asked to bring my voter's ID card. In fact, I have sent my voter's ID card to an agent who is the main person? Recruiting. An agent of whom? An agent of the MPP. I told you. Recruiting so, these people. Recruiting these people to go and register in a Futu constituency, to go and transfer their vote to a Futu constituency, to vote for the MPP. Ordinarily, and, these would be members of maybe the MPP, right? Or, or general, you know, people used, just selected at, at random, randomly? It's, it's people selected at random. It used to be, their recruitment used to be MPP. Uh, people, but now they are influencing NDC people to do the same to vote for the MPP in the future constituency. But but let me ask you this: two mm -hmm. two questions. Mm -hmm. One, do you have evidence? Have you seen any of such messages beyond uh, being told? Some may have been called, so you can say you can take their word uh, for it. But then even then, you would have to um, um, substantiate it. And in any case, don't you think that a discerning Ghanaian, knowing his or her situation, wouldn't be convinced to vote for party A or party B or candidate A or candidate B merely based on, oh, you've recruited me and maybe given me some incentive. Don't you think Ghanaians have got to the point where they can't be influenced by such things so well, easily? I would take the second uh, one first. You see, the human quest to survive 
sometimes forces people to do the unthinkable. So we should not underestimate the influence of resources in our, in, in our electoral system, in our um, um, democratic um, system. We know that there may be people who will say, I'm an NDC. There may be people who will say, I'm an NPP. But when money's exchange hands, then you are likely to consider the sacrifice the other person has made for you. And we have evidence of several people who would say, I voted for A or B because I was given something to vote. We know of In such the, instances where people uh, are even made to swear and exactly. so people are afraid. You right. see, so when people are imported from one constituency to another with financial inducement, there's a purpose there. So they go and fulfill the purpose. Yes, I can claim I'm an MPP. I can claim I'm an NDC. But when I have been sent to do a particular job and paid for it, I'll go and do it. And that's exactly what happened in 2020, exactly what happened in the just ended Assembly elections. If you listen to the, uh, the interviews that was granted um, at the Gomua East constituency, some were saying they were bad. In fact, there was a woman who said that um, they brought two sprinter buses to pick us from this area to go and vote in the Futu constituency. But in terms of the busing, the like busing to constituencies and aiding people to vote, I mean, you do that as well in the NDC. In the NDC, in, would both do, parties are, are guilty as of that. As far as I am concerned. As far as you are concerned, you don't I, know. I have, don't do that. Mm. Let, only, let's, go, let's, let's go to the first point. Yes. About, have you seen any evidence backing, you know, anyone who had received a message, you know, asking the person to uh, do X, Y, Z? Have you seen, or is it just word of mouth? I have told you in the, uh, previous, in the previous interview that some of these things, it is very difficult to put an, a, a hand on the evidence. Mm. But this time around, we have a situation, and, and you yourself or your, your viewers would want to judge for themselves. We have a situation where a person says, look, they came for my ID card. My ID card is with the agent. Why, why did the person give out his own? Because he wants me to go to a Futu to go and vote for a particular candidate. What more evidence do I need to adduce when the person said, my ID card is with this particular person? The reason for which the ID card is with this particular person is because they want me to transfer my vote from this constituency to a Futu to vote for the MPP. You know, and this is something that it needs to be interrogated further. I'm sure you are a journalist. You can send your, um, your reporters there. They can see for themselves what is happening. And it is not only a Goma West. I've always made the point that the Futu Constituency Voters Register is, vo is bloated by at least 20,000 voters. I've made that point. And I am expecting that the security agencies, I'm expecting that the um, journalists or the media, I'm expecting the special prosecutor, all those agencies that would have to enforce the laws around elections to investigate my claims, to see if my claims are credible. Because maybe, maybe beyond that, my advice to you, especially as you want to be a member of parliament, would be and there's a plethora of issues to be dealt with by the state, by media, and all of that. If I were you, what I would do is probably try and find this person who is the agent, not, not have a conversation with him, but if they claim that this is the agent who took our uh, ID cards, right, our uh, voters' uh, cards, and wants us to do this, how about getting someone to, you know, show interest and have some sort of conversation with this person? That, that's a very simple way of adducing some evidence to it rather than saying you're waiting for the media or uh, some other entities to get to it. But that, 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 that is what well, I would have. Some interesting uh, things are uh, coming up, um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure at the appropriate time, right. we will get back to you. All right, so let's get into the papers. Later, I would have us talk about the power outage situation. I don't know about your situation, but yesterday my lights went off. Oh, yes, 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 times. yes. And, and we'll I have a that. gift for you. <laughs> you have a gift for me? Yes. 
What is that gift? Um, my timetable, my personal timetable. I'm seeing Doomsaw timetable. Yes, Doomsaw timetable. Whenever, every four hours. Yes. Um, okay, let's see. You, you may have to hold it to the camera. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll not mention the second place because <laughs> of <laughs> Manchia South and then Kaswa. And that's your Doomsaw timetable. Yes, it's my Doomsaw timetable. How, how, how did you come by this? Yeah, well, the energy minister has asked us to produce our own timetables. Yeah, he says and it is evil to ask for you see, you know, a timetable. Which, which evil I on the country? I don't know what that means. I for you to give me just a couple of minutes on this issue. Doomsaw didn't start today. We acknowledge. Mm. There's a history of Doomsaw. I entered the University of Ghana in 1996. I mean, I was about to say, we can go as far back as well. Yes. And, and, and as at 1997, 1998, there was doom so. And when the light goes off, the students will start shouting, coming out, demonstrate, and all of that. Fast forward, in President Kufo's time, there was doom so. I was then operating a printing press at Awodomi Estate. And I remember taking a loan to buy a plant for my printing press. At the time. At the time. Mm. There was doom so. And of course, during the NDC time, in, in recent times, there was also doom so. But the difference between those doom sos and now is the lack of sensitivity around how we are handling the situation. During Warren's time, there was a timetable. We didn't call it Doomso. Kufo's time, there was a timetable. We didn't call it Doomso. Um, JM time, there was a timetable. We didn't call it. It was then JM time that the word Doomso was invented. Mm. And that's why uh, the NDC time, it was more pronounced. And we made political capital out of it. Doomso timetable enables you and I to plan. Yesterday, I was uh, on Winneba Secondary School, uh, school campus. You have students who are supposed to be writing exams soon. They have to go on prep to learn for their exams. They are unable to learn. They go to classroom, mm. the light goes off, and then they have to go back to their dormitories. Then the light comes, they have to come back to the classroom. Then the light goes off, they have to go back to their dormitories. That is how we are treating the citizen. We have a situation where some uh, parents or students want, um, uh, they, they want to be given testimonials. They were told the lights were not on, so they should come the following day. The following day they came, light was not on. How many times can they go and come? So, so, so I am so abhorred hmm. by the refusal of the government to just do a simple exercise of coming out with the do so timetable. But you should, you should understand, um, you see, it is said that um, as you dig a pit, uh, you must be careful because you might fall in it yourself. And I'm not using it in a negative sense. I'm just using it in this context that because of how we play our politics, and how Doomso was politicized, it becomes difficult for the administration to admit it. And in some areas, the patterns are so clear that you can literally come out with your own timetable, as some people have. Yesterday, I got home. I tried to get home a tad earlier because I had some work to do that would take me into the evening. Guess what? The light went off. For that one, it didn't take long. A few minutes later, it came back on. I started doing my work, and then I, I decided to get a nap. In the course of the night, and, and what I really don't like, I, my fridge nowadays sounds very funny. And I know it's part of this. The one where the, it, it comes on for a second and goes off. So you can tell, beep, beep, then it goes off. Imagine what happens to your AC every time uh, that happens. And you also want to leave it on because you are hot. So that immediately it comes on, at least you get some respite because you may not even know that the light is back. It, it happened like that on four additional Occasion. So five times yesterday, power went on and off in my neighborhood. What can you do? You can't, and, and, and in recent times, just so we cap this off and get into the papers, 
the Tema General Hospital one is one that really got my attention because this is what a nurse posted on social media. And, and tomorrow I'll deal with some of these issues. They just turned the lights off at the Tema General Hospital right now. If we don't get light in a few minutes, the probability that we might lose a lot of babies is high. And we hear, uh, you know, some things happened that led to some lives, uh, you know, questions about that. But my chief concern is why? I don't know whether it is a lack of acceptance or a lack of humility or a lack of <coughs> cogent analysis of the situation. Hey, ben. Ho hold on, hold on. The energy minister says, let those who want the timetable bring it. I don't know of any timetable because the ECG has said it is not necessary. Why would someone just wish evil for the country? But even the PURC has asked for a timetable in a certain context, right? In a certain context, not generally, in a certain context. You decide, fellow Ghanaians. Final yeah, point, we have to I, get into Yes, I, I was going to say, mm. you see, mm. the accounts have a problem. They said, mm. Now mm. you are refusing to accept mm. the fact that there is doom so because you don't want to be tagged with doom so. You don't want it to be politicized. But we are in this country, how we use Dumso to attack and attack John Muhammad's administration. We went on demonstrations. We coined the word Dumso. What we are experiencing here is waste. I think, I I think the point is made on that. That went off about four or five <clears throat> times yesterday. Mm. That is Dumso being a timetable, simple, just right. give a timetable. Well, you, you, you can't come out. The best you can do is come out with your own timetable. <laughs> yes, I've done that. We can, we can wait for the administration to see whether they do. Uh, the Daily Guide newspaper is where I'm going to start from. GRA gets new boss. Uh, Julie Siam is her name. Uh, there's ECG board chair resigns. Then approved ministers as uh, Supreme Court to Parliament. AG ends evidence in um, one uh, trial. So let's, let's get right back to uh, them. <clears throat> The Supreme Court has given Parliament the go-ahead to consider and possibly approve the President's nominees for ministerial and deputy ministerial positions as it is, by a unanimous decision, dismissed an interlocutory injunction seeking to restrain the House and the Speaker from doing so. <clears throat> now, National Democratic Congress Member of Parliament for South Dai, Roxanne Nelson Dafiamikpo, has filed a writ and an application for interlocutory injunction before the Apex Court, arguing that the decision by President Akufuado to reassign some five ministers without parliamentary vetting and approval was unconstitutional. Parliament on March 20, 2024, suspended the consideration of ministers and deputy ministers. It goes on and on, but yesterday we heard the rulings on two different uh, points. One, uh, I believe, 5-2, and the other one, 3-4. Uh, under different circumstances. Then there is, I, I don't think I'll get into the Nam One trial uh, bit, though I know it's, it's a major issue with uh, people with funds locked up. Um, ECG board chair resigns. That story is on page three. The board chair of the electricity company of Ghana, Kelly Gajakpo, has resigned from the ECG board. The astute entrepreneur who cited personal reasons for his resignation in a letter to the president was appointed to the board in 2017 by former energy minister Bwache Ejako. His, registration, his resignation, however, coincides with the current energy crisis facing the country with inconsistent power supply in some parts of uh, the country. Any quick thoughts on these two stories? Yes. Um, so, um, you see, when a car is running into a ditch... Everyone would like to escape. Escape quickly before the car finally um, you know, falls into the ditch. I can see a lot of things happening this week alone. The ECG boss, um, uh, board chair resigning. I know, I know him. I know that he's a, you know, he's a very, uh, I would say, astute entrepreneur, as we will call him. If you link that one to what has happened with the GRA, getting the, one of the deputies to um, step in, you ask yourself whether anything new is coming on board. Now that we have just about nine months to go. The government obviously has failed in many ways. You have cited personal reasons, but we all know 
that these personal reason returns are politically coined to absolve the institution of any perception of mishappening or something that's happened that's causing somebody to resign. But I would not be surprised if perhaps somebody was trying to get the ECG come out with the timetable or there's a certain problem that the public must do that we don't know. That's right. resulting in this resignation. Because why? You have but, been but the a vote chair. The man has chosen not to talk about it. Yeah, we, but we can't infer too much into why. No, but you have been a vote chair for how many years? personal reasons. Seven and a half years. You have just about eight months or nine months to go. So why won't you finish? But, but your... why can't he at any point decide to resign? You can't can. he at any point with with his his history, everything he's done? Can't he say, you know what? Yeah, I, I'm tired. I've done enough. Let someone else also come in. What's wrong with that? Yeah, you can. But you see, Ben, we all know what is happening in this country. We are not naive. We are all in this country. We know what is happening. ECG, or I would say that our energy sector, is not at peace with itself. Right. Our energy sector is riddled with debt. The energy sector is riddled with um, so many issues that borders on incompetence, the energy sector is, is riddled with issues that are self-inflicted, okay. self-imposed. Let's, let's, let's get this into, let's get into other, other issues. I get the point. I mean, we've, we've spoken about some of those. So. But interestingly, uh, getting from page nine onwards, the, the Daily Guide newspaper carries you know, the, the photo. President Ekufuado at 80. You know tomorrow is his birthday. So yeah, happy we birthday. might as well, uh, tomorrow definitely I'll wish him... I the first gentleman of the land, a happy birthday. But happy birthday in advance, Mr. President. He'll be 80 years. And it says history will be extremely kind uh, to him. I remember some weeks back, uh, Gabi Asario Tridaco said uh, he posted something to the effect that uh, Ghanaians would miss um, Ekufuado. And maybe the Ghana Smart Schools project, which has been launched, would be one of the things uh, Ghanaians would miss. I don't know. What, what do you think? I would say happy briefly, birthday very to briefly. the president in advance, but what are we going to miss? Are we going to miss the doom saw that came with no timetable? Are we going to um, miss a president who introduced a policy that feeds children, school children with weevils? Are we going to miss a president who um, shy away from proper reshuffling and kept a finance minister that ran us into economic situation that we are struggling to come out of it. Are we going to miss a president who himself knows that he has failed and therefore his own vice president is running away from his records? What are we going to miss him for? Okay. We were told that uh, somebody point, 70, so 72 years is, is too old to become a vice president. This is an 80 year old president who is exiting office, which means that 72 years, 73 years, 74 years, he has been president of this country. For me, I'm not going to, I'm so disappointed in him because you remember, some of us, when we were students, we were the ones who were supporting this man. During Legon days, Tesco. You, you, you have been a member of the MP. Yes, I was one of the founding members of Tesco. Mm. With Andy Apia, could be as a KCMA and co. Mm. We were the ones supporting this man, uh, this president, in 1996 against J.A. Kufo. So we believe in him. We didn't know that he was, he was just lying his way into power. And we don't, follow don't you him. think that is a bit? I mean, government no, has done something. You say done he was what? just lying his way into power. Don't you have free agents? You said you, you will not implement, have free implement one district, one factory. How many factories do we have in this country? But they've executed one village, it. one dam. No How many extent, dams are working in this country? If it's one percent, they will still tell you. You, they, you they said you are going right. to give us um, uh, the cleanest city in the whole of Africa. In, 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 in Accra. Right. What do we have now? We okay. have now a city that the Minister of Sanitation has money, the chunk of the money, in his room. That is what we are uh, going to these miss. These allegations you are making, the Minister of what has a chunk of... Uh, minister I, of I can't San, former that. Minister of Sanitation. Well, that, that, issue, that issue has been taken to court. In fact, it's still in court in respect of some of the maids and money they took and all of that. I think the OSP has had its day. The court system has had its rulings. Let's steer clear of that. If there's any proof that can be adduced, the source of the money, 
the legal system will take care of that. It is not up to us to do it. So please, let's then you let's are a clear of You that. are in this country. Let's, the Daily Graphic let's newspaper. Issues. Let's let's deal with this. The Daily Graphic newspaper. It's not it's not up to us to confront those issues. We've had we've spoken about those issues time without number. It is not we will not deliver justice on such issues. It is the court system. So if you have an issue on that, take it to court. The Daily Graphic uh, makes sacrifices to impact lives. Uh, Christian leaders have called on Ghanaians to resort resolve to use the Easter festivities to make the needed sacrifices to make the country and the world a better place. They challenged Ghanaians to boldly confront the social ills and practices that threaten their unity and identity as a nation. And just the story, and then you, you do your headlines. New Togo Charter weakens future residents. I'm sure some of you have heard of the stories about Parliament in Togo and everything that is happening. Togo has adopted a new constitution that lengthens presidential terms by one year while limiting the number of terms to one, which will likely allow President Fort Nyasingbe to extend his 19-year rule by a year longer than previously expected. I almost uh, recall his father, uh, Eyadema. And um, the presidency of the tiny phosphate-producing country on the West African continent has been a fairly, uh, family affair since 1967. You can also think about the likes of Olympio and everything that has happened. But you see, when these things happen, eh, I ask myself, where is ECOWAS? Where is ECOWAS? In Senegal, we saw things until now, the 44-year-old Basiru Fai has, and, and I'm very excited about that. But these things will go on. ECOWAS will be mum until there's, there's some trouble. And then you see ECOWAS running helter-skelter. Quick thoughts, and let's get into your point. Yeah, you see, uh, this extension by one year, I wouldn't be surprised that constitution will may be changed again. And I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, these people, somebody like um, Yadama would be given um, a position in ECOWAS, maybe as a chairman or something. You see, it is when you come, I have realized something, it is when you come to power through foul means that you get quicker position in ECOWAS. You will soon become the chairman of ECOWAS or something else. As Africans, I am beginning to believe that our democracies around African countries is deteriorating to a point where a day will come. We will not be able to stop the masses any longer or stop the youth any longer. And we are seeing some in Mali, in Chad, etc. So we wish to go well, but I believe that if you are ruled for 19 years, it is enough. You are not the only person who has wisdom. Let's check out the, the, country, uh, the, the, the stories that you have from the papers. Any ones, because we've dealt with some of them already. So maybe any one or two that you'd like to read. Yeah, I saw a story in the, um, the Statesman newspaper mm. about human trafficking. And I, you know, that has been something that has been my area for a long time. And I am interested in making a comment or two. Okay. It looks like we are still not winning the fight against human trafficking. And there is a need for us to win that fight. Um, a few years ago, the total number of people who were enslaved and in, as victims of human trafficking around the world was just around 150 million. Today, we have passed that. Mm. Right now, when the proceeds from human trafficking was 150 billion per annum, today, the proceeds from human trafficking is more than 200 billion. It means that it keeps increasing. Right. In Ghana here... There was a story in the Daily Graphic recently, the, the UN report on exactly. that. Exactly. So I, I followed that. In Ghana here, we are talking about almost 100,000 people in, in slavery. You mentioned the word slavery, and people are not comfortable. But that is exactly what is happening. Mm. Just a, a couple of days ago, a Nigerian was jailed as a result of bringing somebody from Nigeria right. to enslave in this country. From Onisha. So yeah. it is happening. It's about time all of us take a holistic view. I know that the Human Trafficking Secretariat has a national action plan, but the national action plan is, be, is not being um, uh, promoted enough. Mm. I want to appeal to media houses, 
to look at the national plan of action that has been created by the Ministry of Gender and promote it well enough for everyone to know what responsibility you have within the framework of that. Uh, All right. Uh, Be national before plan I take action. your final words in some 30 seconds, I, I have to do the story. Sad one, uh, the final newspaper on page four. Policeman cuts off ear of suspect in torturous investigation or interrogation. In a shocking turn of events, Detective Corporal Clement Suputor faces allegations of gruesome torture, accused of clipping and chopping off the ears of Judith Yakuma during police interrogations. The incident unfolded on February 29, 2024, at the Tema Community 8 police station. According to reports, the ordeal began when Judith's boyfriend was apprehended by law enforcement. Seeking answers, Judith ventured to the police station only to find herself detained alongside her partner, and this was done to her. Yeah, I mean, Final words. It, it, has to do, yeah, it has to do Our with the approach up. to our uh, law enforcement agencies. Mm. I have been shocked by their, uh, they know they have something that they use to The shock. tasers. Exactly. I've been shocked innocently before, about uh, 10 years ago. And I remember, you know, when I was doing my national service, I was just going for an interview and the police stopped a car, came to the car, and people were just making noise and the police asked, why are you people making noise? And I just... Um, answered, oh, it's because when you stopped, they were expecting you to come. Just by m opening my mouth to answer him, he punched me in the face and blood oozed into my, my shirt. And because of that, I couldn't go for the interview. That policeman died in true uh, motor accident, accident following Kufo. I'm sure you heard of that story. I believe that our approach to law enforcement needs to be humane, okay. with human-centered approach. We all have rights. And you have your responsibility to enforce the law. But to respect my right as you enforce the law. And that's what the law says. James Kofi Annan is the NDC's parliamentary candidate for a Futu constituency. And he joined us this morning to get into the papers and talk about other pertinent stuff. Let me quickly do this. Um, birthday message. A belated one, actually, uh, from Kwame Jumo Adjiman. Um, and it's, it says, happy birthday to my little sister, Mrs. Dora Kumaho. Uh, have a good one. I love you to bits. So belated happy birthday to you, Mrs. Dora Kumaho. And uh, may God bless you richly. Your brother Kwame Jumo says he loves you to bits. Right before we go, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helping us uh, bring you this segment. They're offering you prostate screening for free if you're a man, fertility screening for free if you're a woman. Their branches, you can reach out to them at Accra Spintex opposite the Shell signboard, Kumasi. Kronomabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takradi Anadji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa, and Esiaman Zama. Their call lines 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. And um, thank you, James, for joining the conversation. We wish you the very best. Sports is up next. They do stay for that. Thank you for staying with us. It is time now for us to cut incisively into those issues impacting our country, whether for the good or for the bad. It's time for AM Exclusive, and my guest this morning is a man, he's a father figure. Let me just leave it at that. And he's a former UN senior governance advisor. This morning we shared a hug when he came in, because for the first time, I'm not going to be speaking to him virtually or via phone. I'm going to be speaking to him face to face. He's in the person of Professor Bafo Ajimanjia. Prof. Thank you for coming. Don't mention at all. And you're looking My elegant pleasure. in your, your <laughs> buttercurry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so here we are, and uh, we're going to have those all important conversations. But here's where I want to start power, energy, electricity. Yesterday, my light went off, came on five times. Pre, pre, and for me, the most irritating ones are there. It goes off, and then it comes, boom, then it's gone. Like in a second. 
it's gone. Th those things do damage. To lots of lots of damage. Right. I don't know what your situation is where you are, but a lot of people have complained. Uh, some have said we, we need a timetable. The, um, the energy minister recently had some choice words for people asking for a timetable. I don't know whether you, you heard, but um, let me just read for you. So in reacting to some of what had happened, especially when, you know, the Tama General Hospital yes, lost power. Yes, video. And a lady, a nurse there said, I mean, let me just read verbatim what she said. I don't want to paraphrase. They just turned the lights off at Tema General Hospital right now. If we don't get lights in a few minutes, the probability that we might lose a few babies is high. And per reports, some of these babies were left in a very precarious uh, situation. Some have asked, why did the hospital not have a power plant? And maybe what else could have been done? But uh, how do we also prioritize such entities? But then you hear the energy minister come and say, let those who want the timetable bring it. I don't know of any timetable because the ECG has said it is not necessary. Why should someone just wish evil for the country? People have now had to come up with their own timetables because in some areas it's so constant that now you can have your own timetable. You don't need anyone to tell you. But how, how do you react to this? First of all, are you facing saying? Uh, yes, in a way. I was in Kumasi last week and uh, for 24 hours I didn't have power. I left back here, and I was still told there was no power until 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, that means about Accra, 30 hours, yeah, no power. Yes, 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 in Kumasi. I think it's worse in Kumasi, perhaps, than may, many other places. Here in Accra, well, fortunately, I have a few, uh, uh, what do you call uh, those places for solar. So somehow it kicks in uh, when uh, it's up. So I don't feel it as much as others without solar. But, you know... The tragedy of all this is that towards the 2016 election, it was this same situation that I believe helped the ruling government to come into power. Uh, so one would have thought that such a thing would not be repeated. And this is happening also in an election year. Mm. And that makes it more curious. And the responses of public officials to this question has been very confusing. And at times I wonder whether there's any organization, so to speak, in what we do, whether our public officials are mindful of how citizens feel, because the reaction is coming from all over. In fact, the one you read from the Tema Hospital, when I saw it last night, it reminded me of what's going on in Gaza, where there's a brutal war against the Palestinians, and hospitals, uh, we've shown them on, on the screen, how babies are dying because there's no power and all. But here we are. We are not in a war condition. We have experienced this before. Why would we sit by eight years later to have it repeated? That is a question that I think all of us should, should ponder. I, I do not have the answers. I'm not in the uh, energy sector. But all we are getting is that perhaps there's not enough generation, but we are told there is. Is a distribution, and yesterday I heard so, that so, some some say vehemently, contest vehemently that there is no generational problem. It's not generation capacity. It's about the ability to pay, for example, WAPCO for the gas for things to, you know, the natural course of things to follow. That that is what some industry players say. But I understand that people are saying different things because we are not getting the truth from the source, and that's why people are speculating and making all kinds of uh, statements on this. You know, governance, we always talk about transparency in governance. When you're transparent, you get your citizens to come along. At least if the situation is even not acceptable, they can tolerate it because you are even with them. But when there's no transparency in how our public services provide their service, then of course, you are going to have all this kind of speculation. And for me, it is such a tragic situation for a government that came to power, by and large, with this kind of a problem on the previous uh, government, and then you come in eight years, you have come back to zero. That, for me, is a tragedy. It means this country, either we don't learn, we don't go forward, or simply, we have people who are running our affairs who don't have the competence. That, these are the conclusions I can make. And uh, there's a video from... 
the Tema General Hospital, you know, in respect of what happened. We'll see whether we can put out uh, some of that um, shortly, just to paint a picture of what exactly transpired. As and when we, we have that ready, uh, we'll take a look at them. But if you, if you look, thankfully, the neonatal intensive care unit, uh, the Tema General Hospital has a statement out and it says that no life was lost during the two-hour period of the blackout, which is something to celebrate. We That's thank God for that. But the reality, too, is that we could have easily lost lives. Correct. Because they were in incubators. Correct. That means that we would have, in fact, we started feeling those children right from day one, Correct. right from birth. Correct. In fact... So, uh, Mm. The video that came out, I believe it was sent by a nurse. Yes. You could sense the urgency in the voice, the narration of the, uh, accompanying the video. So I think things were really looking very bad uh, until perhaps now that they are telling us no life was lost and that power has been restored. But these things will not happen, not in the 21st century in Ghana. With all the efforts we've made over the years and with all the experiences we had uh, seven years ago, this is incredibly unbelievable. It, the, the statement says, of course, it points to the happening of the incident uh, on the 26th of March. It talks about the fact that the dedicated generator, as said to the neonatal intensive care unit, tripped off for a short period and the hospital's electricians worked to restore power to the unit until the national grid was restored. Uh, it said it was restored within two hours, so it took them two hours. Imagine surgery being performed or something else, and they have a problem with their plant or their generator. That is enough time for someone to lose that's, of course, his or her of course. life. Just, Even 20 minutes can, can do that. Yeah, that's um, and then it is worth noting that no lives were lost as a result of this power outage. And uh, the assurance to the general public is that the facility will continue to put the health and safety of its patients at the core of its business, which is all good. I remember there was an incident once that took me to uh, that hospital. But you ask yourself, how about the other hospitals and all the other happenings? You are coming from Kumasi, look at Konfuanoche and the problems they are facing, accommodation for medical staff, among others. Then you add this power situation and, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, at times you cannot simply comprehend what is going on. But you mentioned the Konfuanoche Hospital, a hospital that was built to herald our independence back in 1957. You know, we used to call it G, those of us who grew up in Kumasi, Yeko G, G. That was a hospital built in the late 50s. And you wonder why this hospital will be neglected for all these decades, whilst we try to embark on new hospitals, which takes years to complete, and it has taken Tomb for himself to launch an appeal mm. to refurbish the hospital. The same thing seems to be happening to Kolebu Hospital. I read something about it a couple of days ago, and they are facing the same thing. So you wonder what our leaders think about development. Development, is it simply to build something new and neglect the old and keep building? That is not it. Well, we hear of a, a, a maintenance culture. It's real. We do not devote any energies to maintain what we have invested in. So to see Kumasi Hospital, Konfanochi Hospital, before the renovation, reduced to a village hospital, that was pathetic. You think so, CAF has been reduced to a village hospital? Oh my goodness, I was there. I've, I've been there to visit patients. Go to the walls. Crack walls, ceilings sinking down, painted walls. Bears that I don't know how long they've been without uh, changes. It was a bad situation. And that's why I think Otunfo stepped in to, to save the situation. But why should it take him? When we have a Minister of Health, people who are paid to supervise our institutions. I mean, and when you are budgeting, you don't budget for maintenance. And you see this thing rotting in your face and sit by until it collapses. There are so many state structures like this. The other day I saw a video of the Independence Square that uh, sent out up. Independence 1957. Right. Almost rotten. At the center of town, 
This is where the president passes. Everybody drives around that. And yet we sit by for it to rot. Recently, there was an incident. You know, part of the place close by is overgrown with weeds. The same way the Revolution Square, yes. opposite the Jubilee House. I always say that, listen, it may be that it, it comes in a certain context and brings back certain memories. But it's either we take it away or we treat that place well. You know what? Because it's, it's in close proximity to the, the seat of the presidency. Right. Pass by. Recently, I, I took some footage uh, from there and I was sad and something I was discussing with someone yesterday before we go back to the Tema General Hospital and just look at the video the former seat of the presidency the castle castle mm. look at I, I mean I think you saw images was it I late did. last I did. year I saw fungus the whole place has been left to rot and and I tell myself why is it that we behave like this because on the other side I don't like playing this game but imagine this in Europe or America they would have quickly turned it into some sort of museum because guess what? Rawlings was there. Atta Mills was, was there. Well, Kufour was there. was there. Immediately do something. Oh, this was the table uh, uh, at which um, Kufour sat. sat. This was where Rawlings slept. Slept. This is, and they would monetize it. Is it. Is it that we can't think? And the place is rotting. If for nothing at all. There are also governmental agencies without offices. Couldn't we convert? Like, there's no use for that, please. Look, this is really a gold mine in many situations. Uh, other countries, this would be a gold mine. A castle built by the Danes and changing hands throughout our history, right on the coast. And you see, I, 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 at times you wonder, what is it that we learn when you go to school? Maybe we learn something differently from what others are taught. Because <laughs> our minds are not conditioned to do the right things. This is a precious monument that must be preserved. And I think when the last government moved out of the place, it was announced that it was going to be turned into a presidential museum, which was an excellent idea. And through that, we could have maintained it. Now we are sitting by, but you see what is going to happen in the near future if another government to come to say, we have gotten 20 million, 100 million from the IMF to refurbish the castle. Yeah. We go for loan to do something we could have done to prevent the rot. Because loan giving is so easy to us, we forget to think about ways to maintain ourselves. We resort to loans. Don't we go for loans for sanitation work in this country? Uh -huh. So, I, 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 you see, I think the whole idea of governance must be re-examined in this country. And for me, the greatest downside is the over-concentration of power at the center of governance. The fact that we have killed, even though we claim to have district assemblies. On my way to your studio, on your other show, radio, I heard a story of one place, Aladura or somewhere, mm where gutters are yeah. used as dumpsters. A filth exhibition. Uh, yes, exactly. And I tell myself, this is not something for the president to be called. It's not something even for the ministry to be called. It's something for the local governance system. But because we have destroyed the local governance system, we have a semblance of assembly people who are completely ineffective because the, the elites, those in power, want everything to come to them. Mm. You see, there's no democracy at the grassroots. So everybody looks out to the central government for simple things like that to be done. And I think in this conversation, I'll tell you. In some years, decades ago, we have what we call self-help. When you drive through the roads on this country, you see some about a project, self-help project. I don't know if you are old enough mm. to have seen that. Self-help projects. I don't recall those. Well. I tell you, I'm an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> Self-help projects, you know, where local communities were taking responsibility for their local needs. We have to begin to look at development at the community level. Let yeah. people take charge of, the, of themselves so we don't always look up to our craft for the basic things that we need. Community-oriented development is what I'm talking about. And because we have concentrated power at the center, even a common classroom block to be built will have to come from Accra. Directions will have to come up from Accra. 
we have what you call in the 2004, I led a, a delegation uh, to Germany to look at their decentralization system. They have a beautiful phrase for that. They call it help for self-help. In other words, local communities have to help themselves before the federal government comes in with support. Help for self-help. So look at the Swiss system and, and the correct devolution, yes. you would also see devolution, the power devolution. And this is shown in the United States. They have a federal system, but the state system within the state, districts, communities, mm. upon their own police uh, inspectors and police mm. officers. Mm. That is how you develop. Development cannot be imposed on us by a government that may not know is left from the right. So the initiatives of people, innovative skills of people are killed at the local level because everybody has to come to the national level to be known to be somebody in this country. And for me, that's the downside. All the problems that we can talk about today, you will find the roots in this system we have created. Mm. That is killing the creativity of individuals because not all of us can function at the national level. The communities will be the focus of our development. And I'm yet to hear any of these aspiring leaders even talking about the need to develop our communities, giving power, devolving power, so that we can have our DCs to be responsible directly to the people, we can initiate projects, and the national government will simply provide the support where necessary. Mm. That should be the focus of our development. Let me quickly do this. I'll come back to some of those points, but I, just want, I don't want us to lose track of that point. I want us to make it before we go. The video, the footage from the Tema General Hospital. I just want you to take a look at this because Doomso has become our reality. Some are forecasting that whoever takes over, whether MPP or NDC from next year, is going to be problematic. So you take a look at that. This baby is on CP. There's no light to connect us. No flow meter to even connect with the oxygen. And we don't get light in a few minutes. Probability that we might lose a lot of babies is high. The whole world is full. No CPAP, no light. Everywhere is off. Everywhere is off. Babies are in data. This baby is not fine. CPAP is off. No light to connect. No flow meter to connect to the oxygen. There's oxygen by no flow meter. This is not right. We have about 10 critically ill babies, all on CPAP. The whole place is dark. If you don't get light in a few minutes, the ability that we might lose a lot of babies is hard. It is not funny at all. Samajin and Tensi care units, where the child ill babies are being monitored. Everywhere is off. Everywhere. Babies are on sick. Babies are on sick. No flow meter. No extra flow meter to connect to the oxygen. At least that would have helped without their sick hands. That would have helped. So there you have it. Um, Prof, you saw for yourself. I did. And hey, yes, him. <laughs> Benjamin, you see, this hey, yes, is him. Oh, I mean, hmm. it's, uh, what can we say? That's why I said this reminded me of Gaza, seen the, on, on Al Jazeera, showing pictures of uh, Al Shafa Hospital and children uh, without uh, incubators and no lights and all. Uh, we are not in a worse situation, are we? We are not, but here we find ourselves. But, but, but moving on from there, you started talking about the filth exhibition. So let me just pick your quick thoughts on that. The filth exhibition, what you were listening to on radio. The filth engulfing yeah. Agra is, is, I mean, you go through town. Don't even mention, I don't want to single out any places because some may feel that you are denigrating where they, you go around Agra. One, one of the things that, um, usually hits me. Cattle and the rest, major highway, you see cattle. 
crossing. And some of them are displaying their dung on the road and everything. It's just such a menace. But we were promised the cleanest city in Africa. No one had to hold the president then, hold his neck and say, give us the cleanest city in Africa. But at least we, we should have had some semblance of a cleaner Accra, even if not the cleanest city in Africa. What do you see on that score? Well, this wasn't the first time a president promised. I think, uh, if I recall correctly, I stand to be corrected, when uh, President uh, Atamels, Evans Atamels, was in power, uh, getting to power, he also promised 100 days of uh, something. Yeah. 100 days of cleaning Accra yeah. in particular. 100 yeah. days passed and nothing happened. So I'm not surprised another one came to promise uh, making Accra the cleanest cities. And of course, that is part of the erosion of trust in our leaders. Making statements that they don't seriously think about and promising things that they cannot deliver. And again, if you want a city to be clean, it shouldn't be the job of the central government. You see, that's why I'm talking about reforming our governance structures. Sanitation rightly belongs to local government. Mm. As little boys in the villages, we are town council people. They will come and inspect the barrel where you keep your water to make sure it's clean. Bankasi would come for you if That's right. things were not yes. in, in the yes. proper order. And weekends, uh, the town, village will mobilize people to go to the public toilet to clean it up. And when there was a need for another toilet, the community will construct it. I guess the point I'm making is that the system we have right now has simply put everything in the hands of the central government. Concentration of power. Concentration of power. Over concentration of power. Sanitation is not the job of a president. President should be thinking of bigger things, the bigger picture, the vision. And this and is where you, you feel the assemblies and, and district Correct. chief executives and municipal chief executives are failing. Precisely. That is their job. So I think one of the downsides of our democracy is neglecting the participation of people at the grassroots. I call this top-heavy democracy, mm. elitist democracy. It's not on the ground. The uh, assembly elections we, we hold, what do they mean? Because they do it without resources at the local level to undertake anything. So I think we have to begin to refocus on what I call community-oriented development. Let's get to the communities. Mm. There's no need for- how, how do we do that? Simply system is what it is. How do we do that? That's why some of us are calling for constitutional reforms. We need to reform the constitution, even though, you see, uh, I think on independence, our president said that there's no rush to, uh, to, 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 to change the constitution or to reform it. You see, our success as a democratic state is simply in the area of elections, what you call electoral democracy. Mm. We succeed in changing and retaining governments through the ballot box for the past 30 years. That success has not translated into the development that people uh, want to have. So we need to change the structure to enable all Ghanaians, no matter where they exist, to be looking at their communities as a source of political power. It doesn't make sense to me for someone to finish the university tomorrow and join a political party with nothing behind him. He's lucky the party wins. He's made a minister. What was the training? Yeah. And when they come and in a few years they build mansions, we wonder. Because when you're a minister, when you're a big public official, you are compelled to have certain facilities because people come to you for money and you don't have a house so quickly you have to build a house. You know what that reminds me of? The Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute. Institute. In Winneba. And, and what purpose? Because having lived in Cuba, one thing you see, whether you want to say it is propaganda or whatever, they start you right from when you're a baby. Right. You are ingrained, I mean, it, it is ingrained, imprinted yes. in you. The thinking so speak to any Cuban, I'm not talking about those who have moved to Miami and the rest, speak to those who live in Cuba. They, they tow a certain line. They think in a certain way. It is nationalistic, it is this and that. Of course, it will not be as social in thinking as maybe when I was there. That's right. 
compared to now, after Raul and others came through. But there's a certain national perspective, yeah. Yeah. Which, which we seem to, to lack on that front. Some have even suggested that the National Cathedral Project, I know I'm bringing in something else, uh, since it's not, that they should turn it into something like that, to train uh, people for such What you're endeavors. talking about, Benjamin, is simply to look at our educational system and what it's producing. I'm a product of the Young Pioneers. I was in it for two years before. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I was in the Young Pioneer. I recall all the things that we were told to be nationalistic, patriotic, and all that. Of course, somehow it was abused by those who were hero worshipping in Chroma and turned into a kind of a cultist kind of stuff. But the essence of it is what we just said. How citizens become patriotic, how they become nationalistic, Non-toxic nationalism, I should say. And again, you look at our democracy, and it seems like people think the only way to democratic success is to be as liberal as the Western countries. Mm. So we talk about liberal democracy. Of course, you've got to be liberal. Look, when uh, this past independence, when uh, I heard you and others discussing uh, the nation and whether independence has brought us anything good and we are comparing ourselves to uh, Singapore. We like to do that, don't we? We do. Have we ever asked ourselves how Singapore made it? I know. And, and once you mentioned liberal democracy, I was going to ask you about Lee Kuan Yew. Because those 30 years, 30, 31 years, they used to move from third world to first world. Uh, democracy, yes. But it was a different... That is the point. Different trajectory. That is the point. And f with my, some of my friends, the intellectuals, we meet and we talk about it and they think I'm, not, I'm illiberal. I, I, I'm I talking about dictatorship or something. I say, no. Lee Kuan Yew and his successors, if you read them, they tell us of three things for development. And that's what they did to achieve progress in their country. First is integrity. Integrity. And recently there was an election uh, in Singapore, and if you followed it, you will be amazed. Nobody comes from anywhere to become the chief minister. There's a process, rigorous pro process, where your background, everything is checked. And I'll come to that if there's time. So integrity. Then they talk of discipline. Discipline from public officials to ordinary citizens. That's why, in fact, today I was there years ago, and I knew that if you chew a gum, chewing gum, and you throw it oh, yeah. on the street, yeah. they will arrest you. You spit. You spit. You get arrested. You spit. <laughs> and you know the beginnings, if you read his book, you realize that when he started this, because Singapore is a small country, it's an island country, so they don't have the privilege or the luxury, I should say, of space. So he's there to build up. You know, building up is building high-rise buildings and moving the peasants into this. He told them, you cannot bring your pigs to a seven, eight, ninth floor buildings. But the, 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 the peasants say, no. He said, okay, take them. Some carry their pigs, you know, in Asia they like pork. They carry them to the seven, eight floor. And then they realize they cannot live with a the pig there. So gradually, they all send the pigs away. That's how he brought them to understand that for the kind of development we are pursuing, we cannot do what you used to do in the past. We've got to change attitude and everything. So integrity, discipline, and the third and final one they will tell you is what they call the unflinching commitment to nation building. These are the three key things these Asian countries have succeeded in doing. So you ask yourself, in Ghana, extending to so many other African countries, we talk of integrity. Who are the people who will elect to rule us? We, do we care the Constitution gives only three conditions? A citizen, right? Of Not certain, below 40. Yeah, of a certain age. And then, sane mind. These are the three. And how we even determine sanity. We don't. <laughs> it's another we don't. issue altogether. So anybody can come in today and with money in your hands, yeah. seek the presidency. We don't care about the background of the person. Mm. Over the years, has this person been involved in any... Deals, arrested. I don't know if the, our security agencies check that. But the fact that anybody can go and be registered to run for the presidency raises a lot of red flags to me.
Right. And, and, and speaking of this, you know, continuity and sometimes that, you also look at the examples on the continent. I mean, look at Yoweri Museveni. Yes. Look at Senegal and what has happened yeah. there. Yes. Thankfully, it's been resolved with Basiru Fai. That's right. 44 year old. I'm so excited about him and yeah. I hope he sets a very good precedent yeah. for young people. Yes. Um, but then you look at the other side where you have had Cameroon, mm -hmm. yeah. Uganda. Yes. Where you've yeah. had presidents there for three decades, four decades. Equatorial Guinea. Yes. Right? Lema. And then you, you look at Fonya Singbe and what he has done in recent times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The extension by one year. And you ask yourself, is it necessarily he's not staying even on for long? He's that now even developed? proposing that president will be elected by parliament, but not by popular vote. Yeah, they might just announce that. Yeah. Go. You see, for me... Let, let's be careful here. Longevity in office is not necessarily evil if the person in, in charge, the person in power, has a certain character, desirable character. Mm. Because Lee Kuan, you as you mentioned, was there for about 26 years. Yeah. He changed his country. Mahathir was there for 23 years. He changed Malaysia. And even in Africa today, we are beginning to see progressive changes in Rwanda. Mm. Kagami has been there for 2018, going to 20 years. Longevity is what enabled them to do that. But when you talk of longevity, and the character in charge is a destroyer, like Mobutu being there for 33 years and destroying the nation. You see? So for me, longevity may be good. Perhaps. When the, the former president, uh, Kufo, was leaving office in his last statement uh, address, if you remember, he said, look, let's make this at least five years at a, a tenure. Because you get into office, first year you are trying to find your feet. The two years you're trying to do your, your, your stuff. Then the fourth year is coming, you're thinking of elections. And our leaders, therefore, don't have what it takes to plan long term. And one of the problems we have in this country is precisely this unbridled competition by power, uh, for power by two, uh, by two parties. So we don't have continuity. We don't have long vision. Right? So we do things quickly to satisfy people. And then we don't satisfy them because we don't have to. Singapore did not become what it is in four years or eight years. That's a fact. Malaysia had not become what it so is. So what, what are you proposing? I, I mean, some, some countries have as much as six years. Yeah, like some have five. six years. What is your proposal? What do you think we can do in Ghana? Well, for me, certainly the four year is very limiting. And if you're extending it, if you're extending the duration, and at the same time, we have, we have to have mechanisms in place to check whoever the leader. Because see, the, 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 the danger is, if you are not lucky to get an upright person and you put him there for six years, you are locked in for six years. But if you are lucky to have a good person, six years is good for you. But some would, some would also say that, listen, it, it can either favor you or not favor you. Right. Now, I'll not mention any president's name, but imagine the presidents we've had. And imagine some of them had done, let's say, six years, right? And they were doing another six. <laughs> it, it could be disastrous. It doesn't have to be another six because depending on your character, your performance, mm. the citizen, again, you're attributing certain uh, value or uh, quality to the citizens to be able to decide, look, this guy cannot go again. See, democracy is such a thing you've got to think through. And I think one of the mistakes we've been making or we have made with our constitution is to mirror the Western democratic practice. And democratic practice is not the same as principal democracy. The universal values that all human beings treasure is different from practicing it. Practicing it enables countries to tailor the practice according to their needs, their history, their tradition, their culture. That's what democracy is. So when you follow blindly, because America has four years, let's have four years, why didn't you say France has six or seven years during that time? Why did we choose four years? And there are so many things about democratic practice that we need to critically review. Yeah? I see. Yeah. 
Let's, let's also look at this latest um, tussle between the executive and the legislature on the LGBTQI plus bill. What do you make of it? Now we have the Supreme Court saying, well, Parliament, your hands are not tied. You can go ahead. We have the precedent of Mr. President on the 4th of March saying his hands were tied when, in fact, the case wasn't even in court. It was in court on the 5th. Uh, some say both entities are being dishonest or they are, it's, it's power play. What do you see? <laughs> Certainly it's a power play. But let me tell you this. It's healthy for the legislature to hold the executive to account. That is critical. And I'm happy in so many ways. This parliament is really playing that role more effectively than before. I guess it's because the speaker we have today belongs to the minority party. So it's easier for him to do that. And more importantly, we have a hung parliament. So there's no one dominant party that, that can have his way. I can easily imagine a situation where if the ruling party were in a majority, this bill would have been passed or rejected, or it, maybe it wouldn't have come out at all if mm. the president didn't want it. Okay? But where our representatives, 275 MPs, where they have met, deliberated on our behalf and made a decision unanimously. I think the executive ought to respect that. That's very important because they represent, for better or for worse, they represent the collective interest of Ghanaians. Mm. And if the president has serious reservations, I think he has every right during the process of making the bill of intervening in different ways. Right. Democracy requires that kind of interface. You cannot sit here aloof and the legislature is here aloof and think we are ruining the country. There is need for collaboration between these top uh, branches of government. And even after the bill has been passed, the president could have still met the speaker. If they did, I do not know. But publicly, we don't know that. That they could have invited the speaker, have breakfast. Look, let's discuss this. This is a major national issue. You know, maybe the reason why I'm resisting this is because A, B, C, D. The speaker is a human being. He's a Ghanaian. You understand? And being a speaker, he also have a way how to get parliament to understand certain things. But to really reject, not even reject. You say, don't bring it to me at all, which is unconstitutional. The bill should come. The clerk of parliament was rejected three times. And the statement by the secretary to the president. It's basically funny. telling him, don't come, don't come here. And these are highly responsible individuals who have been in this business for so long. They've fought in the trenches. They know democracy. They've spoken democracy. They've eaten democracy. And they are behaving undemocratically. So I think always we have to respect the process and see how it works. But we cannot undermine the Constitution as it is today. We are not happy with it, but until we change it, we are bound by the Constitution. So you feel, just to quote you, you feel the executive acted undemocratically in, in that? Oh, by, by just telling Parliament not to do his job of submitting a legislation to the presidency. He has a job to do. And you know, when he gets to the president, he has three options, isn't it? Say, I'll, I'll veto it, I won't sign, or I need certain amendments, or whatever. There are three options, I understand. Take you it. can veto it. Huh? He can also say, look, uh, there's a problem with this. Exactly. I, I, we need to discuss. We need to renegotiate. So you can use those uh, medium to, to see what you want. But to stop it as if it's a, it's a, it's a use my word, leprosy. I, I don't want to touch it. It's, 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 it's not the proper way to, to, to do. Because mm -hmm. leg, the legislature has its own powers. The Constitution provides it to make laws. The present duty is to Take it, review it, and make your judgment. But you cannot stop it in this track when the job is done by the legislature. Let's get into some core governance issues. I'd like us to start with corruption and where we are. I don't want to get into the bit about indices, corruption perception index, and all of that. But on the ground, with, and, and this was a crucial issue in 2016, yeah. the economy, corruption. Have we been able to tame that beast? You know, 
Benjamin, this is a very important question. And again, I feel even tired talking about corruption because as one president said, it started <laughs> from, from Adam. the days of Adam. Yeah, you know. But more seriously, this is an issue that has bedeviled us all these 30 years of our republic, fourth republic. And because of that, we have established institutions from Shraj to Yoko to this, to that, to that, to OSP. OSP. The conclusion I've come to, Benjamin, I'm very sincere in this one. Institutions by themselves are meaningless. Because people talk about capacity building, institutional building. You can't, look, we started capacity building of institutions in the 90s when I started the civil society work with IEA. Then 1998, Jima Bodhi and I founded the CDD. Institutional building, institutional capacity. And we are creating more. For me today, that is not the issue. It's not the solution. It boils down to the individuals that we place in, to head institutions, the character of the individuals, and of course, the character of the people generally. Because institutions can be as good as the one who leads it. Why, why, and, do, why does Nkrumah's words come to mind? So in this light, we could also say, our institutions are meaningless unless they are accompanied by the right people at the The helm right of people with integrity. Correct. And the system that permits the, these people to work. A classic example. Some of us, some people were euphoric about the appointment of the uh, uh, SPO, OSP, the Office of the Special Prosecutor. But some months ago, he came public to say, look, didn't he come to sing that song to us? Mm. So you can, you can even have the person with the integrity, with the courage and everything. If the system itself is not working, he's not going to succeed. So I think there are two things here when you're talking about corruption. For me, I'm not interested in creating new institutions because they are just a drain on the economy. They don't produce anything. And I'm not even interested in new laws. Ghana has all the laws on the books. I'm interested in the quality of people who are put in charge, and at the same time, the quality of Ghanaians. There's a certain mindset that perhaps integrity is not part of governance. It is. In fact, when I was talking about Asian countries, I mentioned integrity as number one. And it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a missing link in our development. People gloss over it. And as we're approaching the campaign period, I'm hoping the aspiring pres, uh, presidents would address the issue of integrity. Because when you talk of corruption, you are talking about integrity of public officials. Those who can, uh, cannot be bought by money to do the wrong things. Those who can reject an offer that will lead to building a road that requires six inches uh, uh, asphalt and uh, ends up with one inch, so the next rainfall, the, the whole road is washed away. Mm. Integrity. You know? And I've listened to you, Benjamin, uh, some of your shows talking about this issue, so passion. And people might think, uh, you, uh, who is this guy? He, he thinks he's as integrity. No, we all have our weaknesses, don't we? But these are critical issues when you're talking about governance. All the successful countries, besides the Western countries, America, the way it developed, we don't, historically we know that America has a different way of developing on the back of blacks and all that, we know that. But in modern times, to develop, you need that. And we don't have it. And nobody seems to bother. And that for me, is, 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 is the greatest dent on what you want to do. Getting the right people, leadership that has integrity. Mm. We don't. Well, they say our leaders reflect us. And uh, people get the, what you say, the people get the leaders that they deserve, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but sticking to policy, you've heard of the one student, one tablet uh, bits, Ghana smart schools and everything in between. In fact, that promise the laptops and everything were made in 2016.
So it's been seven years on. You would ask yourself, because this is not the first time. In 2008, this was done. Something similar, a promise that was made. In 2012, another promise. You ask yourself, why would you wait to execute in an electoral year? What is in there? But the feasibility of it, people have said, students don't have what they will eat. What's a more more tablet? Or more more laptop? And even when you look at the budgets, the numbers pre presented to parliament, and you look at the actual numbers, the 2.1, three or so million. You realize that it's only a fraction of them who are going to get this. So what are we really doing? Is it cosmetic or is it real? What's your take? <laughs> you know, we have politics of promises in this country. Doing politics and seeking power is all about making promises. Just as somebody just promised that if he wins, who dredge the sea to Kumasi, so Kumasi can have a port. <laughs> I'm talking about screening our presidential candidates. You know what I mean? Yes. They are promising just to get votes. Because seriously, and you're right, there are certain fundamental problems with the education. Kids are still lying on their stomachs to write, to learn to write or to read. Some are on the trees, some are in, have been seeing the exposures uh, you and other media houses are, have been giving us in very dilapidated structures. And these are not priorities. Well, some believe, some people may believe that to develop, just have an elite group that is highly skilled and all that. Maybe that's what people are thinking, but not mass based. So, Again, this issue of laptops reflects this mindset of governments that we have to feed the people all the time. You can have an arrangement with any banking institution where teachers can be assisted to buy this, their personal laptops. You can, a government can give them some guarantee loan or uh, through the banks so they can pay. Right. This spoon feeding, you see, that's why earlier I talked about government, uh, our governance system being top heavy and everything is at the national level. The go our governments have this mindset that if they, we have to develop, it should sit in Accra and spoon feed everybody in every corner of the country. It doesn't work that way. It's a simple thing, laptop. These days, it can be expensive though, but below 100,000, uh, sorry, $1,000, you can get a very solid laptop. In fact, you can scale down to $500. You can get a laptop that will do the job that any, child, any teacher wants. And this is what we cannot find a way to get our teachers to have, if that will help them in their, in their, in their work as teachers. For government to promise this, and seven years we're still trying to see if you can meet it. And you can never meet it. There's no money for that. And this comes back to integrity again. Promising things you know you cannot deliver. In and fact, that, in the case of the teachers, even moving away from the students, they paid 30%, and some would say even the rest of it was paid from their SNIT component. And 100,000 plus of them have not got those lines. Still, they are In other words, they, they paid, but they didn't get it. Why would the government get itself into this? So when we talk about trust, losing confidence and trust in God, which is in political terms, trust is the biggest capital in governance. When your citizens trust you because you are consistent in what you say and what you do. Consistency. All this lead to people losing trust in government. Suspicious of government. I cannot have a successful governance when people do not trust what you say because you don't do what you say. Mm. So it boils down to the issue of integrity I'm talking about. Because if I know too well, Ben, I can't give you this. I will not come and tell you, come for this. And then let me wait for five years and still don't get it. Trust, integrity. Trust. Yes. Two issues I want us to wrap with. Um, one has to do with taxes. And nowadays you make a purchase or you go somewhere to eat or you do anything and you are looking at around 22% in taxes. You, you must prepare for that shock, 22% more than one-fifth. Recently, the vice president said the GRA was harassing you know, 
people. The business community, at least the Importers and Exporters Association, came and said, we'll not play those shenanigans anymore. What have you done with the e-levy and everything uh, in between? And we also know that the, the head of the GRA has been ousted, and now uh, Julie Esiam... He's not been is, ousted. Is, he's retired. In, indeed. <laughs> in fact, you know, there was that story about his being 62. And That's so right. So he's retired. Post. So the president has terminated his appointment, okay. so to speak, and replaced him. I want you to talk on that. And then finally, when you're done, governance. Tomorrow is Nana Rodanko Ekofuado's birthday. Wow. Happy birthday. He's been in power Mr. for President. what? Close to eight years now. Right. How would you score him on governance on a scale of one to ten? So those two quick questions and we're gone. Let's do that in about two and a half minutes. The taxes, certainly when government gets desperate looking for uh, money, to run its operations, if you are not producing to gain money, income, then you go out to tax. And I think our government has been overtaxing people because our productive capacity has not been fully exploited and, uh, and uh, uh, utilized. So the need for resources for government is, is really great. And now that uh, even our access to foreign loans uh, has been more or less uh, blocked. They are tending to people to overtax them. And taxation has a, a limit. You reach a certain point, you can no longer tax people. Cool. Otherwise, a rebellion will be on your hands. And that's where I guess we are, we are going. Uh, one of the candidates has promised to revise the taxation system and do a flat tax. I don't know how it works whether that's going to reduce... I mean, we've heard Dr. Baumia say that, yes. Oh, okay. I don't know <laughs> whether that's going to reduce the government's income or it's going to increase it or going to stagnate it. I don't know. But whatever it is, knowing too well that our coffers are literally empty and we are not getting easy access to this foreign money, I'm afraid, unless a government embarks on aggressive domestic policy of regenerating our productive capacity. And here, let me be blunt. There are so many things we as Ghanaians can do for ourselves we don't need to import. And the first one is food. We don't need to be importing all this food. In the 70s, again, let me remind ourselves, <laughs> in the 70s under General Echampong, Operation Feed Yourself was able to make a self-sufficient in rice production for three years. This is a historical fact. With the Dr. A.O. Abudus and the rest. That's right. You got the names. We did it before. And today, we are importing how? $800 million a year or $400 million a year. We can't even find it. And when they produce poor distribution and processing challenges, will stop the fair distribution of what you produce. So we've done it again. So if the government wants to reduce the burden of taxation on people, then the focus will be on how we, 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 we produce ourselves, for ourselves, what we can produce here. Mm. And I can go and on, on Burkina Faso, you were talking about cocoa, I saw the program last night. You know, Burkina Faso is saying that in five years they should be able to export cocoa on the Sahara not to talk about their determination to be self-sufficient in food production, because and the recent decision by ECOWAS to block them has taught them a lesson. Right, and, and, and just to get to the final point, then like Dr. Richmond, Etia Hene was sharing, you know, we are here with all the lush, you know, very fertile, verdant land pasture, yes. and we import onions and tomatoes and the rest from the Sahel. That's right. The Sahel. Ironic. It's not but, ironic. But on the final point, governance, how would you score a Kufuad on a scale of 1 to 10? You know, I, I don't know whether you'll be charitable because tomorrow is his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, happy birthday. Uh, you know, frankly, I have never rated presidents in terms of their performance. But I'll tell you why. First of all, the good people of Ghana are the best to rate a president and his government. Even though he's leaving office, mm. his party is contested. Right. And I think the good people of Ghana will rate the performance of this government and the president during elections. Mm. That's what I believe in. 
Of but course. the reason I brought this in, and you notice I didn't make a general. I said governance because that is your area I know. in terms of governance. There have been up and downs here. There have been up and downs. And I think if we take the area of integrity, this government, this president has not impressed me with anything to that effect. Mm. I've not been impressed by that. But you see, Again, we all make mistakes, especially politicians, to think that governance is satisfying the material needs of people. It's not correct. Two sides. People want to be satisfied materially, and they also want to be satisfied psychically. Right. Psychic satisfaction, psychological, if you will. So I know one regime that did so much in infrastructure development, but the party lost only because psychically, People did not believe it was the right one. So if you provide all the schools and all the hospitals and all build all the roads, and yet people feel like it's meaningless because we haven't gotten what you want. They haven't satisfied their psychological needs. Okay. So this president, I think, listening to what people say and what I read, and I do talk a lot to people, psychically, a lot of people are not happy with the performance of this uh, government. That's what I can say. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for having breakfast with us. Yeah. We're so grateful that today you came into the studio. <laughs> it's uh, my pleasure. It, and thanks for having me. It's a privilege. We're, we're very grateful to you. That is um, our guest for AM Exclusive this morning, Professor Bafo Adjimendu, a former UN uh, Senior Governance Advisor. He joined us uh, for this all-important discussion. Do stay with us. There's still a lot more we have coming uh, your way. We'll be hosting Ohene Yuri Gifty Anti in a bit. But before that, I will take you on as far as that issue, the Supreme Court dismissing the application uh, of Roxanne Nelson, Dafia McCoy, in respect of the president's appointees coming before parliament. We'll actually bring you some footage on that and have a discussion on Singh. Up next on the AM Show. The five-member panel of the Supreme Court was presided over by the Chief Justice herself, Gertrude Isaba Tokuno. The other members of the panel were Justice Kinsley Kumsen, Justice Maria Mawusu, Justice Amadou Tanko, and Justice Yao Dakun Asari. The court described the application filed by the NDC MP as frivolous and, ab and an abuse of the court process. After this judgment of the Supreme Court had been handed down, the Attorney General, Godfrey Yabo Adami, said he was excited about what had happened and that, in fact, he did not agree with members of the public who sought to suggest that the Supreme Court were handling this case especially and not paying much attention to the case involving the anti-LGBTQ injunction application filed by lawyer and journalist Richard Delasky. The application clearly was, was frivolous and there ought not to be any um, manipulation of what went on in court. Even Parliament itself was opposed to the application. On, on the cases that are being heard, there are those who have taken the view that some cases were filed two weeks prior to this case being filed and the Supreme Court has proceeded to deal with it. The Chief Justice himself has raised issues about persons not prosecuting their own cases. Well, what do you make of it? Yes, I mean, as I said, it's most unfortunate that persons will file up processes before the court and then and fail to take an interest in it. On record um, in Parliament, it's a letter that I wrote to a speaker asking him to reconsider his decision and all. So I expect Parliament, after having come to the Supreme Court, to oppose this application to also um, reconvene and, and deal with the, the matter related to the approval of the, of the ministers. I asked the Attorney General specifically if he's interested in getting that injunction that has been filed to stay the hands of President Ekufuado on the anti-LGBTQ bill and whether or not he'll be filing for the Supreme Court to actually deal with the matter expeditiously. He said that he does not intend to prosecute the case for the, the, the person who had filed this case in, in, the, in, this, in this suit Richard Delasca. Is the position that if Richard Sky does not prosecute this case, the Supreme Court is not going to hear it, and the, 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 the hand of the president is going to be stayed on this bill up until Richard Sky decides that he takes an, he takes an interest in this matter. Well, if Richard Sky does not prosecute the matter, the application will be dismissed. <laughs> the process he has filed in court will be dismissed. Yeah, yes, but so, and, but hold on, hold on. I think that the duty to fix the date for hearing rests in the registry of the, of the Supreme Court. And I do not understand where this business of people actually um, scrutinizing when applications are faced for hearing or why this application has been for hearing even came from. 
The Back in the days, if we file an application in the Supreme Court of Ghana, it takes even three months for you to have a date for hearing. It is only after a party has made an application for an expeditious determination of the, of the process that the matter will come up for hearing. And indeed, in, in the record, we show that this particular case, for the record, it must be indicated that the I specifically applied for an expeditious determination of the, of the matter, I applied for an expedited hearing of the application. So it is not the Supreme Court of Ghana uh, picking and choosing which applications to hear and not to, not to hear. Any party to any matter, back in the days, I used to do it even when I was in opposition. You that apply for an expedited uh, hearing in the case, case. case. So I think you should ask the plaintiff. Well, the plaintiff is the one who instead the action. The plaintiff is the one who instead the action, and the plaintiff ought to um, bear the responsibility for, 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 for the conduct of the, of the matter. I'm not going to conduct the case for a plaintiff. Another big issue in court today had to do with the appearance of the NDC MP and his lawyers. Neither the MP nor his lawyers were in court today. There was no explanation as to why they were not in court. But the bailiff of the Supreme Court was put under oath and he gave some facts to the Supreme Court. He said he went to the law firm of the lawyer for Rodstein Nelson, the firm of that is, that is Nick Paco Samuaro, to serve on him some court documents, including the hearing notice for today. And that when he did, in fact, go to the law firm to serve these documents on him, he did not meet the lawyer himself. He met one person called Na, who told the bailiff that lawyer Nick Paco Samuaro had categorically instructed her not to receive any application, any court processes, any document from any person whatsoever. And that he did indeed proceed to lay the documents on the table, which would have meant that the documents have not been truly served. The Attorney General had been pressing for the, 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 the lawyer to be referred for disciplinary proceedings and that he described that as a, the highest form of disrespect that any person can do to the Supreme Court. For lawyer who has filed an application in the matter, to direct a rejection of the affidavit of position that has been filed by the other side. I mean, it's, it's really, for me, gross professional misconduct. Be that as it may, uh, the court proceeded to deal with the matter, and, and, and that is it. Um, I think that was very unfortunate, especially as the same counsel was in the same day filing processes in the Supreme Court of Ghana. Earlier in the morning, he was rejecting processes from the Supreme Court of Ghana, and then in the afternoon, he proceeded to file uh, processes in the same Supreme Court of Ghana. And I think the processes of the highest court of the Republic ought to be respected. The dignity and authority of the court always ought to be protected and respected by all counsel. And that is the point I sought to make in court. But the court, led by the Chief Justice, said they will take some action on that at a later date. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, the Supreme Court, Accra. Welcome back on uh, the AM show. Now we continue from there with that footage and yesterday the Supreme Court ruling on uh, the matter, the application filed by South Dai legislator Roxanne Nelson, the uh, being deemed frivolous, also in the words of the Attorney General Godfrey Yabwadami. But how does the, the applicant, the person who filed this suit, feel about that situation? We're going to have a conversation with two lawyers, one the very person who went to the Supreme Court with uh, this matter, Roxanne Nelson, Dafia Mekpo, the South Dai legislator. And on the other hand, we'll have uh, Kweku Paintel, also a lawyer on uh, this uh, matter. Mr. Paintel, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Hello, Kweku Paintel. Do we have Mr. Paintel on the line? Yes, hello, I'm here, I'm on the line. Okay, I can hear you now. Can I, couldn't, you? I couldn't hear you initially. Thank you. Right. You're uh, welcome. Looking, looking at the processes so far and everything that has happened, culminating in the different votes, I believe five to two and three to four, on different questions posed by uh, the applicant to the Supreme Court, what do you make of, of what has happened as far as the court's ruling is concerned? 
You are talking about what transpired yesterday? Yes. Yeah, I think the Supreme Court has thrown out their application for injunction, meaning that the substantive matter will stay, the substantive matter that they want the court to determine with regard to the power of parliament to proceed with the, what do you call it, the determination of the capacity or otherwise of the people that the president has nominated for the different ministerial positions. That will stay. But if you, I mean, I mean, I think it's the right thing that the Supreme Court did. Because, see, an application for injunction is what we call an equitable relief. An equitable relief essentially looks at what would the parties, I mean, I mean, we have moved from law to equity. What right. it means is that if you come to the court and you are seeking an equitable relief, you are essentially trying to demonstrate that if nothing is done about staying proceedings or staying matters, I mean, the way they are proceeding, by the end of the proceedings, I'm talking about the substantive matter, you will have lost something which we call irredeemable. In other words, it cannot be redeemed in any way. But it does not... This particular case does not appear to fit into that category at all. My understanding, if I'm right, is that the applicant is trying to restrain the court from, I mean, I'm talking about the application for injunction. I mean, the application for injunction is that parliament must not sit over the matter. But the point of the matter is that if the court has to weigh the issues, if parliament proceeds to hear the, uh, what do you call, do the sittings and they pass these people and become parliament, uh, they become ministers of state. And eventually the court were to make a determination that these people were not qualified. The real question is, what would we have lost as a country or as Ghanaians? I'm talking about the equitable, I mean, the equity involved in this matter. Alternatively, if the court Please, we are talking about governance. We are talking about running a country. We are talking about people filling positions. And the was to end. And by the time that it ends, the court comes to the conclusion that the decision that the president took to appoint these ministers in accordance with the procedural rules was correct. How are you going to compensate Ghana as a country for the time loss, for the failure of these proposed ministers to act in those positions? And that is how uh, the Supreme Court came to the conclusion, even though I've not seen the full copy of their ruling, but I believe that that is why the Supreme Court comes to the conclusion that the application was frivolous. It's not every matter which is pending before a court of law that the court ought to restrain a party or I mean, a, a party from doing the proposed act. It cannot be. So I wholly agree with it. Hello, uh, Mr. Painto. Mr. Painto, uh, we cannot hear you unless maybe, I don't know whether you've pressed the, the mute button. Can you hear me now? Right, it could be a network connectivity <laughs> issue. Mr. Painto, if you can hear me, just go back about 30 seconds. We lost you. Well, uh, we'll try to get Mr. Painso uh, back. We'll also try to get Roxin Nelson Dafiamakbo, uh, who is the one who's been in court. Uh, Roxin, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Ben, I can hear you. Good morning to your viewers, and um, it's, it's a privilege to have joined you this morning. How do you feel, or how did you feel yesterday when the courts literally threw out your applications uh, before it? Uh, how did it make you feel? Well, the the but I I'm I'm indifferent. These are constitutional matters, so there's nothing like uh, a loss or a win. Um, so um, to that extent, um, I'm all right. But I'm worried about the procedure adopted. The procedure adopted, with all due respect to the court, I think was. Um, um, uh, I have a problem with it. 
Let's look at why? that procedure. Let's let's quickly look at those procedures you speak yes. of and let's why you have a problem procedure. with them. Now, a party applies ex parte to the court mm -hmm. for expeditious hearing. Who is this party? The Attorney General. The Attorney General has publicly stated that he applied ex parte to the court without recourse to me, nor my lawyer, nor the other, nor the first defendant in the matter. Mm. Now, the court proceeds to act on that ex parte application. Then the court decides to, to now serve the process. If you attempt to serve my lawyer and you fail, you have to serve me the party. I'm the one you are supposed to serve. You say they attempted to serve and failed. They, the bailiff went, I'm sure you followed. The bailiff no, no, says he on, went. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on since on, you, you brought ben, it up, ben, the bailiff ben, went ben, to ben, the ben, the firm ben, and ben, and ben, and ben, was ben, told. Roxen, let's have a conversation. Ben, You've brought a point. I'm trying to lay the foundation. You can respond to it. Ben, he went to the firm. Is, is the receptionist to purportedly told him that he could not. That she had been directed not to allow any, you know, filing of this, and he left it on the desk, he left it on the table, which the court considers to be duly serving the party involved. Is that not what we know? Yes, that is all you know, but that is false. You're saying it is, is false. false. I'm saying you, 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 you've laid a very prolonged foundation, so let me address the matter. No, be, before you do, so you mean the bailiff lied? The bailiff lied. Well, you think bailiff don't lie. He lied, even before the court. The bailiff lied. The bailiff went to tell the court that Somebody told him that he, he has been instructed not to receive court process. And the name of the person the bailiff gave to the court is Na. Do you know how many Na's we can find in the, in the dancing? Is there a Na at the office at, at that firm? I don't know. I don't work there. I don't know. That is my lawyer's office. But I have no idea whether a certain Na works there. But if a certain Na works there, is that, is that how the bailiff should communicate the identity of a person who receives a process in the court firm? The court itself has laid down procedure in service. And, you have to, and, and the procedure is that if a party's lawyer cannot be served, you serve the party himself. So I won't belabor this point because the, 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 the deficiencies have been exposed. Yesterday, he was exposed. Now, uh, uh, just, just before you go on, I, I always like to... So, you're basically saying, and mind you, the bailiff was brought, he swore. You know how it is done in court. The chief justice herself was there. You are basically suggesting the bailiff lied under oath. That is the point I'm making. Okay. That is the point I'm making. That is the point, to the extent that the Attorney General will actually move the court that disciplinary proceedings be brought against the lawyer, even without hearing the lawyer. Is that how things, things are done in our, in our judicial system, that after hearing one party, you proceed to, to draw conclusions? Is that how things are done? So this matter, me, I am so happy about actually what happened yesterday, because it exposed the inefficiencies in our judicial administration. Because what, what in, my, in my humble view, the court ought to have done, because there was no urgency about the matter, was to have directed that, make sure the parties are properly served. If you can't serve the lawyers, that's fine. But ensure that you serve the parties properly so that we could return to court next week. But it didn't happen. The court proceeded. And, and, and said, what is frivolous about my application? And let me ask. It, it appears that a lot of people don't appreciate the point, the, the constitutional point I am raising. And let me restate it. I am saying that the president woke up on the 14th of February this year and publicly said that he had dismissed some number of ministers. I didn't. I didn't issue that communication for the president. It came from the president. He said he was dismissing this number of ministers with immediate effect. 
I did he use those phrases? He he used those phrases. And that he was he was he was thanking them for offering public service. And that he wished them well in their future endeavors. The president proceeded to give the names of the ministers he has dismissed from office. Then he then he went further to name some minutes, some persons that he, he wants to nominate as for purposes of parliamentary approval, for purposes of appointment as ministers of state. Then after that communication, the minister says that, the, the president says that some ministers that he has just dismissed from office, he has reassigned them. And nobody thinks that there's something constitutionally improper about this. Based on the authority in J.H. Mensah versus the Attorney General, mm. I am not saying that the president hasn't got power to appoint people into office. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying the procedure for doing so is that if you want to reshuffle ministers, reshuffle them. Don't dismiss them from office before you reshuffle. So if you tell me that you have dismissed somebody from office, the person is no longer occupying that office based upon which he can be reshuffled. This is the technical point I am making. Right. And, and that brings me so, to... So, to... Hold, so hold on. Then the president proceeded. So I raised the matter, if you recall, on your channel on, on the evening of that Valentine's Day, I raised the matter and I cautioned them that if they don't correct the communication, I will sue. I said so. It was even that interviewed me and one other person and forgot it. So after one month, I asked him the matter. The president proceeded to communicate with parliament. What did he do? He sent names of persons he has nominated for purposes of ministerial appointment to parliament for purposes of um, 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 the satisfying the requirement in Article 78 and 79 of the Constitution. In addition to that communication, the president now sends the names of ministers of state that he has dismissed and, and informing parliament that he has reassigned them to other ministerial portfolios. This is the government of my, 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 my complaint before the court. So I am saying that the president intends to sidestep the parliamentary pro approval requirement. You, you can appoint people into ministerial portfolio by all means as the president. But the requirement under Article 78 and 79, which says that such appointments must be subjected to pro parliamentary approval, is what I am demanding that it be given effect to. So I am right in asking parliament not to proceed with the other, other vetting process of the other ministers until the entire government of list is, is complied with. So do you appreciate what I'm saying? I get what you're saying, but at least so on the, the second so point where the ruling so was three so to four so on the new nominees, right? At, at least that, 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 was, that was a point made by the Supreme Court, right? Sorry? I'm saying on the second point, there are those who were already ministers, right? Who were just moving, yeah. switching portfolios. And yeah. there were those who were now coming in, whether as ministers or deputies. There was a ruling on, on, on that as well. How, how do you react to that? Okay. Here is, here is the point. The president did not separate the communication to parliament. Mm. It was one act. So it is that business that I am seeking to injunct. It is one single presidential act, one communication. You cannot decouple that from the other. You okay. Can. All right. Uh, hold because, for me, Roxon. So, uh, so my point is that now those ministers who supposedly have been reassigned, even though they've been dismissed from office, we have been told that they can go on and continue to carry themselves out as those ministers until the matter is determined on its merit. If the matter is determined that they ought to have received proper parliamentary approval, the damage that would have been caused, how, how is that repaired? So on the balance of the probabilities, I think that the court ought to have been, been 
more fair with me and said that, well, we could, we could direct that. We could direct that the six be injuncted from carrying out themselves as ministers of state until the matter is determined on its merit. But the, the freshly nominated names, parliament could proceed to deal with them. It would have been a fair determination, in my opinion. But that didn't happen. So uh, here we are, my brother. Hold for me. Let me bring in Kweku Pinto. Kweku, you were making a point, and then we lost you briefly on that point, so we can move forward. Yes. I mean, I haven't heard my learned friend. I fundamentally disagree with him on both points. The first place, the issue of service, the rule of practice is that is the lawyer with the conduct of the case who ought to be served. And he served in his registered chambers. And it is whether he's present or absent, a process could be left. So it's not a question of meeting the lawyer's absence and stuff like that. We run law chambers with personnel. And it's not about the physical presence of the lawyer in chambers. And even though there might be an obligation to serve the party directly in peculiar circumstances, there was no need whatsoever for that to be done. And if the bailiff left the process there, whether with or without an incident, that was proper service. And it is not open to the lawyer or his client to come to the court to plead that they were not aware. I mean, that cannot ever be the case. So I disagree fundamentally with my learned friend as to the mode of procedure for service on him when his lawyer's office was open for business. That is the first point. The second point is about the question of determining the interlocutory matter. I fundamentally disagree with him. We are talking about people who are going to serve public office. And if the contention that they are not fit or whatever, even if it is held at the end of the substantive matter, what would Ghana have lost? That's the real question for him to answer. Ghana, what would Ghana have lost if we get somebody to occupy an office for which he's not qualified, as you claim? But look at the inverse. Look at the, I mean, the inverse of the situation. If at the end of the proceeding, the Supreme Court throws out your case, then Ghana would have been without a minister or nobody would have filled that portfolio. And I mean, what, what happens? How, how do we even assess the consequence? I mean, in terms of, I mean, our national programs and stuff like that. So on both counts, if he has a case in the Supreme Court, at the right time, the Supreme Court will make a determination. The issue we are dealing with is what the country as a whole must in the interim do. The Supreme Court has said, and I agree with the Supreme Court, that an application that seeks to stop a minister from performing the duties or functions of an office on the basis of an allegation that the procedure for nominating him is faulty is, is, is not one that the Supreme Court ought to rely upon as a basis for injuncting that nominee or however from operating or from running in the office until the determination of the case. I notice that my learned friend are not be able to say what the country will lose if at the end of the day, these people have acted in the office and it is determined that they acted wrongly. What practical thing will we have lost? So that's the way it goes. Even on a parallel reasoning, even our Supreme Court has ruled that even in chief tenancy matters, if a chief is taken to court on, a, on the basis of the allegation that he is not fit and whatever, that cannot form a basis for restraining him from performing the office. And that if he performs in that office and at the end of it, the matter is determined against him, everything that he did was performing the duties of a chief, even if it was illegally in occupation, would be valid. These are fundamental principles that we can apply. I mean, with the Supreme Court determined. And we are talking about a serious institution like, I mean, ministerial position, whatever, in the governance of this country. And all your cases that you, they, they, they ought not to be. Fair enough. You may win at the end of the day. But the question that I'm asking my learned friend to tell the, his, the audience is what would the country have lost? even if the court came to a conclusion that they were not entitled to occupy the office. That is the question on the floor. Hold, hold on and for me, Kweku. I do not know whether... Uh, I do know that sometimes you would look at the consequences, what the, the other person or the other party will suffer. But whether it is limited yes. to purely what you're saying is another point. But I'll leave 
uh, Roxanne Nelson, Dafia Makbo, to respond to that. What is your response to Kweku Pencil? Now, <laughs> my senior Kweku Pencil is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is saying that today, uh, personal service on a party is not fundamental to a court process. Is that what you say? I'm saying that. that I'm saying that. Kweku, 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 wait, it's, it's wait. I want him to make his point, and then you come in. Kweku, Kweku, please hold for me. You should go and read Barclays Bank versus Veta Cable. You should go and read that case. You should go and Supreme Court decision. You should go and read it. So, so I'll leave the issue of service. Today, if dumping a process in the premises of a lawyer, not even the lawyer, in the premises of a lawyer, not even a party, is good service, it's fine. I mean, when the Supreme Court makes a determination on a matter of procedure, it becomes law. So that is fine. Until another decision erupts, that becomes a procedure. So it's fine. The second point that Kweku is asking me that I should, I should, I should, I should show what, what, what damage, what damage will be caused if we have people acting in ministerial portfolios who ought not to have been there. You should go and read the new the new Contracts Amendment Act, where we have determined the people who have the capacity to enter into contracts on behalf of the state, and see whether, if you are not qualified to be a minister of state, and yet you are permitted to act in that capacity and you enter into contract, the consequences for the republic and the state. So you should not be making this pedestrian and whimsical argument. Uh, Roxanne, this, this Roxanne. Are very, these are very weighty, these are very weighty matters. He has not been Roxen, able to... I, I beg of you, using the term pedestrian has a certain very connotation. Well, I withdraw, withdraw, I, I, withdraw. But okay. I, I withdraw. But I'm saying that this is a very weighty constitutional law matter. Because the requirement for pure parliamentary approval is so important that it cannot be sidestepped by a certain communication from the office of the president, if that is what they are suggesting. It cannot, as a member of parliament, I will not allow that requirement to be glossed over under any circumstance. Because, you see, in constitutional law governance, there's nothing like miscommunication. When you take a decision, the decision is taken. So when the constitution is breached, it is breached. It has to be remedied. I, I have two quick questions for you before I come to Kweku for a response. Why... The double application, the first on the 21st and the second on the 25th, the court found that duplicitous, a mere replication, when in fact it was the first application uh, the court was being told uh, to rely on as far as the speaker's determination was concerned. That is question number one. And question number two, why is it that you send this case to the Supreme Court and yet on D-Day, which was yesterday, you were nowhere to be found and your lawyer... Uh, Mr. Somado was also nowhere to be found. You couldn't be found in court. Why? Now, let me, let me kill this mischief. You may be in court, but if you don't receive a hearing notice served on you, how do you go to court? Has the Supreme Court determined that I was served as a party and I refused to appear? If there's anybody who is, who is, who is, who is, who is a court animal in this country, it is me. And go to court regularly. Because that is where I think that I can adjudicate my grievances. So the suggestion that I came to court and yet when they when it was it was time for the matter to be heard, I didn't show up. It's purely political. But when it was time for service, I mean you were served and you didn't show up. Uh, what ben, they are saying. Ben, are you listening to me? I am. Has the court made the effort to serve me who came to court? No. Your lawyer was so, served. Can you, can you let me finish? So the option open to the court was to serve my lawyer. Now, a certain belief claims that he, he didn't find my lawyer, but he went to my lawyer's premises, his law firm, the premises of the law firm, and saw a certain now. Nah, and I'm saying that is not how court, court processes are served regularly. But if the court makes the determination that, you see, the essence of service, is to notify you to appear. So if the form of the notification is in itself regular, you cannot be in court. What are the circumstances surrounding this matter? I filed an application on notice.
to the defendant that I, I intend to seek an interlocutory order from the court. Now, the Attorney General claims that he has been served. And without entering appearance, he now files what we call affidavit in opposition. And then right, he claims that he wrote to the court for expeditious re without copying me, without copying the other defendant. The court acted on this expeditiously and issue hearing notice and actually varied its court, court, the court list for the following day. All this happened the night before or the day before the hearing date. And people are all over the place as saying that they asked me to come to court and I didn't appear. Look, so, so that don't let us. So, so do you feel you have been, you've been treated unfairly in, in this entire process? In any, case, in any case, let me put this on record. I am happy that Attorney General publicly stated that he, he applied for expeditious hearing of this matter. And, and, and let me add the expeditious hearing of the matter is not only limited to the application, the injunction application. It's actually, it, it, it actually involves the entire case. So I am looking forward that this matter will be listed quickly for his hearing. I mean the substantive matter before the court. When you say substantive matter, which one are you, are you referencing? That is the risk. The risk, okay, the right. risk based upon which I brought the application. Th there was also so this question about... is asked for expeditious hearing of the matter. It's not limited to only the, the, the injunction application. It's actually in respect of the entire matter. Right. There's also and, this and question. I'm hoping, Roxanne, and I'm hoping that we, we have limited only, time, so let's make the most of the time left. Uh, there's also this question about uh, claims that, listen, Richard, the last guy's issue was there, and the court hasn't fast-tracked that enough, but this issue has been heard, and, and there are some disagreements there. What exactly is the disagreement? Disagreement in respect of what? The Richard Delaskai uh, suit, which, of course, your end, the minority was hoping would be dealt with uh, speedily in, in respect of uh, the bill. And your case uh, has been heard ahead of that. Some feel something doesn't add up and that, that other issue should have been given a prime of let place me, as well. Let me, let, me, let me offer this. I, I think the position of the minority and the NDC is that there appears to be abuse of the use uh, abuse of discretion come, come. that's all they are saying that there's no fairness in the exercise of discretion because in exercise of discretionary power you're supposed to be fair and not whimsical if matters come before the court and they come in a certain sequence in terms of this and they touch on similar things because the injunction application in respect of which is Kai and, and, and Amanda Aubrey, I think so, is actually directed at Parliament, all right? Not to remit a certain deal passed by Parliament to the office of the President. That they are actually injuncting that act, that function to be performed by Parliament. So it's also, it's also borders on the exercise of a constitutional mandate. Okay. And that, that has been pending for a couple of weeks now. All right. And my first application is also to injunct Parliament from proceeding with a certain performance of, of function under the Constitution. But mine has been prioritized ahead of that. The people have a right to, 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 have, to express their misgivings about that. It, it's not up for me to say. I leave that for... Uh, for the judgment of the ordinary people. All right, thank you, Roxin. Um, um, I'll come back to you for your 20 or 30 second take. Uh, Kweku, I know you have a lot to say. You have one and a half minutes to say it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say that I believe the Supreme Court was very right in reaching the conclusion that it reached yesterday on the interlocutory application that was before it. And what it means is that the weighing the equities of the matter. My learned friend is speaking as if his application would automatically be upheld at the end of the day. I, as to the merits or otherwise of it, I make no comment. But as to the interim, 
I believe that the Supreme Court was very right in reaching the conclusion that it's reached that weighing the issue on a scale, it is better for the, the, the interim application to be dismissed and right. then for the Supreme Court to go into the substantive matter. Okay. How to I mean, fast track that matter will be left to my learned friend and all the other parties in the matter. That's all that I need to say. Thank yes. you, Kweku Pinto. Uh, Roxen, some 20 seconds. What are your final thoughts? That I, 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 I pray and hope that this matter will be expeditiously determined as already prayed by a party in the matter. And, and I hope that um, uh, we all learn uh, from what happened yesterday that we, we need to do the proper thing all the time. If I'm properly served, I will be in court. I don't see a court. I All go right. to court every time. Thank you. And uh, so the politics that I refuse to go to court is a big lie. Right. Uh, 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 this this final point, though, very quickly. So it means Parliament will now have to hear, uh, sit, you know, on, on at, those, vet those people not, and then proceed, right? Parliament, Parliament, Parliament is not enjoined to do that. Oh, I see. Parliament can still say that pending the determination of the, of the, of the matter on its merit, it won't proceed. It is the right of Parliament to say so. So Parliament is basically going to sidestep or ignore the ruling of the court. That's what you're but saying. Parliament, the, the, ruling, the ruling didn't direct Parliament at all. The ruling didn't but it points to Parliament your application ruling. in court on which basis the Speaker made that decision. Yes, but, but there's, also a prayer, there's also a prayer for perpetual injunction. Read my relief. There's a prayer for perpetual injunction. All right, which is, which, is, yeah. which is yet to be granted. But thank you. Thank you uh, for joining the thank conversation. Uh, Roxanne Nelson, Daphne Amakwa is uh, the legislator for South Dye. He's been in the thick of things on this going to the Supreme Court. And uh, we also had Kweku Painto, a lawyer. Stay with us. There's still more to come. Welcome back on the AM show. And um, Easter is just around the corner. It's the season of giving again. And guess what? Ohene Yuri Giftianti is on a campaign to feed some 2,000 underprivileged children in the central and eastern regions this Easter. We're talking about that up next on the AM show. And this is my... My big sis, who has been AWOL, absent without <laughs> <laughs> leave. But before we even get into anything, <laughs> you know, it's, it's been less than two weeks since we came here. Yes. And I used to be on the other side, side. <laughs> as well. How do you find our new studio? It's beautiful. You know, there's nothing like a spacious studio where you can maneuver, move things. I just love it. I love it. Okay. I honestly love it. Once we have your stamp of approval, I, need, <laughs> I love it. It's beautiful. beautiful. <laughs> But let's talk about this wonderful project. Right. How long has it been? Seven years? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. Since you started this? Yes. It's been seven years since we started. I started a small IT Dumasa and then for the children of squatters in my area. And then we expanded it gradually. We ended certain areas in the um, eastern region. And this year we are doing central. We are doing our front plains. We are doing... Um, Idumasa, of course, where Idumasa is a bigger because about 10 communities converge there. Mm. So we have Jekiti, Ajina, Pese. You know, I remember um, two years ago, there were children from certain communities that the chief of Idumasa hadn't even heard of before, even on his land, you know. So settlements along the Volta um, Lake. And then we have, um, of course, the children of squatters in my area as well. Mm. So this morning we are donating to um, Central Region, Pastor Cynthia McCauley, the gospel artist, minister, right. uh, yes. Um, she is coming to collect the, uh, the, the, the items for Krobo. There's a village near Cape Coast called Krobo. Okay. It's also along the Volta, um, uh, along the um, sea, okay. you know, seaside. And there's a major issue of teenage pregnancy there. And you know the causes of teenage pregnancy. Sometimes children, they go for, to beg for fish, and the men are sleeping with them just to give them fish. 
you know, so two years ago, we gave them clothes, shoes and stuff. So this year, we want to feed them and then we take the opportunity to talk to them and educate them as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have Afram Place also coming. We call them Hope Shelter. They are, um, it's uh, a rest just, just quickly on the Krobo area, yes. you're, you're giving them cash as well, right? Yes, we're adding you're cash, yeah, because cash. they'll have to cook for them. So we are giving them rice, bags of rice, um, oil, um, 10 tomatoes, thanks to La Bianca Company Limited, we are giving them boxes of chicken. You know, we'll, give, we'll have to give them uh, take away, we can take away packs, spoons and everything. Then we'll add money to it because they'll have to buy the smaller spices and things like that. To add. So we'll add money to, to that. And we're giving same to, um, and we call him Uncle George. He's in charge of the shelter at a front place for rescue traffic children. You know, the big issue of traffic children. You know, I met them at an event um, last year. And since then, they become, you know, I've become their adopted mother and grandma. So everything I get, I try to give them. So they are giving them same. And then on Saturday, we are feeding about 600 children from the Edumasa area. The area is called Tafu area. And then Sunday, we'll take some to Shai Osudoku. There's a, a village called Kewum Atro, Atrobinya. Kewum Atrobinya. We are going to feed about 300 children, and that will take them to, some to uh, Akwemufi as well, also about 300, so roughly 2,000. But of course, we are hoping that, because even as you publicize, you get more people telling you, oh, my children need some. This is, so mm. we are hoping that we can do more. The 2,000, we still haven't gotten there yet with the items we need, but we are trusting God that the God of the last minute, 11 hour will show up. Mm -hmm. So you're feeding 2,000 kids, but yes. there are 600 that you are targeting on Saturday. Right? On Saturday. T tell us about that. The, these are children from the Edumasa area, okay. about 10 communities. You know, sometimes you see where they walk from during Christmas to get a pair of shoes. Hmm. And then they get the shoes and you see some of them carrying it on their head. You know, and then some of them also leave their old shoe and wear the new one to go. So these children oh, will wow. gather at the, thanks to the chief of Edumasa, Nanasa Akwao, and uh, um, his queen mother, Nana Sewa Brikitu, for making it possible always for us to use their palace. Um, this time they said we have to use their forecourt because the 600 children will not fit into their palace. So we use the forecourt of the, um, of the palace. Thanks to Phoenix Deco and Bridal, she said she's going to do a bit of deco for us. So we'll oh, wow. feed these children, we'll give them cooked, jol I mean, jollof, chicken. Um, we are hoping to add biscuit, drinks, water, and also, again, talk to them as well. Yeah. Mm. Then on Sunday, you are heading to Akwemufi. Akwemufi, yes. Also the, in the... The that's number there, 300. That's the, yes, so the it's in that mother, same yes. catchment area. Yes, the same catchment. Uh, Edumasa is under Akwemu. Mm. So that's the headquarters. But the Queen Mother, Nana Frakuma II, is celebrating her 60th anniversary. It was actually on the 9th of March. Okay. 60th, as since she became a Queen Mother, you know, her history. She became a Queen Mother at the age of 18. Yeah, so she's been on the stool for... 42 years. No, 60 years. No, you say she was 18 and she's 60 now. Or is no, the anniversary her, of... Uh, yes, oh, enthronement. Okay. Yes, enthronement. So that's 78. 60, so she's 78 now. Right. Yes, yeah, she turned 78 in... Um, on February 14th, so f February 14th, yes. So we'll go as part of it to help celebrate um, the children and the aged in their community. Mm. And then we'll, um, the, next th the other 300 will continue to Shai Osudoku. The area is called Kewum Atrobinya. Okay, I, I, I don't see how you have to take your time. <laughs> it's called what? Yeah. I'm putting you on the spot. Kewum Atrobinya. Okay. You know, Professor Pesa, yes. You know, uh, Professor uh, Pesa White. Yes. Pesa White, yes. He, that is, is Michael uh, Pesa White. Your, yeah. The, yeah. The other one. Um, I don't know, Professor Fess, you know, but I know he contested elections sometimes. Okay, ago. so that's Michael Pesa White. Okay. You know, so that's his area. Um, Christmas, he actually reached out to us to help another group. That is, um, that area was called Jopo. They were part of those affected by the, you know, the spillage. Mm. So we went to give them shoes, drinks and stuff. 
um, like that. Soap, clothes, everything we could get. We went to give about 400 kits there. But this time we are going to another area who also need our help. Also in the Shai Osudoku area. You know, just travel Ghana and see. My brother, travel Ghana and see. When we went to the Jopo area, whew, as a journalist, I've been to places, but... Yeah, well, I do all. Ah, sad, sad. When you see the kids, when you see the kids, the way they look. At the time we went in December, they had no decent... It's morning, but toilet or drinking water. You know what comes to mind? Because recently, based on Ghana Statistical Service yeah. um, data and what we have also unearthed, we, we, we put a, a league log of, you know, the areas, for example, beaches or yeah, yes, points yes. where open yes. defecation yes, is the most yes. rife. And yeah, and the recent one you. is the... Uh, it would shock you. The exhibition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The filth exhibition Sorry, and filth everything. The filth exhibition, it's sad. Really so, so you see, that's the reality yeah. they're talking about. That's the reality. The reality. Mm -hmm. They don't have a place to attend nature's call. No. And so they, they didn't they have any have portable to. drinking water. No potable drinking no. water. No. So what's their source of water? They, they used to go to the same polluted river. That thanks to the spill, spillage got polluted. You know, so we actually, if you see, the, I sent some... Um, and we have some pictures. pictures. You, can, you can speak we to some We send bottled water, thanks to uh, Trillium Ghana, and they've come on board once again, Vena Mineral Water. But for how long can they keep that? Let, let, let's speak to some of these pictures. Okay, this we... is my area. That was um, last year. No, last two years, Christmas. So we, we give them, you know, we have... It's a, quite a new area, so we have a lot of squatters around. Mm. You know, their kids, they grow up with our kids. You let them feel a part of it. So I open my home to them once a year. And then they come, they get food to eat, they get clothes, they get shoes. So this was it. And these are still kids from the, you know, my area. And yes, some friends who came to support us. Yeah, and this is Edumasa last year, Easter. Look at the number of kids. This is just wow. know, one tenth of the children, you know. And they come from all over. The area. And this is, yes, this is Jopo, my beautiful kid. It's at Jopo, the Shai Osudoku. Look at them. The uniform, these are school kids. <laughs> you know, and, and this is also feeding the agent at Edumasa, um, the palace. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, still at the palace at uh, Edumasa, um, the kids. Still the agent, you know, and yeah. Well, some know, amazing yes. strides yes. you've so made for yeah, seven we, years yeah, the, yes. now. Um, I know there are some groupings you would like to thank. You've mentioned yes, some yes. of them already. Yes, I'll Labianca. let you do that and then okay. finally okay. appeal to yes, others. Yes, 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 yes. So I'd like to say thank you to Trillium Ghana for Vena Mineral Water and Bigo Drinks. Um, La Bianca Company Limited, they gave us, you know, 10 is it boxes or cuttings of chicken? You know, they are, they are new uh, products called Akoko Tasty, a homegrown business made in Ghana, packets and everything. Thank you so much. Thank you to Best Deals Shipping um, Company Limited. Thank you to Auntie Ale's hair, you know, salon. Thank you. She, yesterday she blew my mind. I went to fix my hair and she made a donation. Thank you so much. And to all those, I can't mention everybody, but every single individual who's contributed we are grateful but we need more we need more water we need more drinks as for the chicken we have enough so thank you i'm not greedy we need rice we need oil um, we need biscuits we need toffees anything you can contribute please 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 the number is 0598 586868 0598 586868. You know, lawyer Adauga, or uh, is it Adauda? Adauga, the, he was an uh, MP. You oh, know. the NDC. The NDC, yeah. Right. He, he shared a story on one of the uh, shows that um, Nana did, and he said he taught in the north, right? Not in some, I, I think, think Upper is, East is or something. Kojoga Adaudu. Adaudu. I think, in the, um, I think in the Upper East, and his kids, he used to give them toffees anytime you do well in class. Then he later on he met one who had become 
a doctor, he met a doctor or something, I think a pharmacist, and the person walked to him and said, hey, sir, do you remember? I said, no, he said, hey, say, you used to give us toffees in class when you did. So I told myself that if I do well in class, I'm giving toffee. Then when I become a doctor, I wonder what I will get. That is what motivated me to become a doctor. Wow. The things we do for the little ones that we think is just one off, that is what causes the change in their lives. We want to create a society wow. that believes in the goodness of humanity. We want to create a society that believes that it is worth supporting each other. We have become a selfish society, unfortunately, but we need to change that. We don't want our children to be worse than us. We want them to be better. Mm. So let's reach out. You never know whose life you are touching, who you are, you know, encouraging to become somebody. We, we meet nurses, doctors, lawyers, journalists who are better because they feel society failed them so they don't have to sacrifice for society. Let's change that. So please support us. Please. There's a place up there and on earth for people who give. Don't be tired of giving. Please, we beg you, follow us on social media. You see all the work that we do. That's the Gipsy Anti Foundation on, on Facebook. Please, please, please support us. 0598586868. Every little helps. God bless you. Okay. We're grateful that you've passed through because the rest of the convo, some of them say after this, we are going to have to do some. You know. Yeah, be -twe. Be -twe, be -pe. Very small one. It's like that. But it's, it's really younger, good to see Younger you. brothers, that's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you after so long. Good to see you. Thank yeah. you so much Since for joining migrated. us for this. Thank you, yeah. And it's beautiful. It's nice to feel the studio. Mm -hmm. Me too, I have come some. Yeah. I have to write, Gifty Auntie was here some. Oh, yes, yes. 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 We'll find a nice little corner. Okay, please. Etch it out. Thank you for coming, and of course, let's all support a worthy cause and put smiles on the faces of especially uh, these children this Easter. But stay with us up next. We're going to be interacting with you, interfacing with you, the conversations we've had. What are your thoughts on them? We'll be right back on The AM Show. Nestled between the twin communities of Boabin and Fema lies a remarkable forest reserve known as the Boabin Fema Monkey Sanctuary. In this nature conservation forest, you'll see a harmonious existence between humans and monkeys with the local community safeguarding these monkeys as sacred beings. The Boabin Fema Sanctuary is probably one of Ghana's most renowned examples of traditional African conservation and the local populace has for generations held the monkeys as sacred, a reverence thus intricately tied to their ancestral beliefs and spiritual practices. Francis Ampuma is a senior guard here at the Babin Fema Monkey Sanctuary. He shares with us how a great hunter in the early 18th century discovered a calabash near the Daro River which attracted the monkeys to the community. 1827 there was a great hunter called Nanamwa who came to this forest to hunt. And he found a nice river called Dauro. At the riverside, he found a nice blast into the blacked calabash, covered with a white calico. And he took it to his house, and the following day, the monkeys followed to his house. So the mona, male and the female, and the black and white, male and the female. So he consulted an oracle. And oracle told that these monkeys, they are the children of the river. And the blood that you took from the river is a fetish. So everywhere they will send the fetish, the monkey will follow. That's why they follow to his house. Traditional beliefs in these communities strictly prohibits physical harm to the monkeys, hence they live in harmony with the indigents. <laughs> there are two types of monkeys here, the mona and the black and white colobos. Solomon tells us more about these monkeys. We have the mona monkeys and then the black and white colobus monkeys here. Mm. When we check the forest here, the size is 4.5 square kilometers, mm. which is over 5 acres of land. It's everywhere we move in. The monkeys are everywhere. So we have the mona monkeys and then the black and white colobus monkeys. 
these different species of monkeys have a behavior they show out over here when you take the mona monkeys they eat most of our food like banana orange pineapple all those kind of fruits and most of our local food like fufu yam bread biscuit they eat all of them mm. so if you are living in the village here it's not surprised to see the monkeys in the various houses mm. so they come to the houses to take food from the people mm. so they come when they come and then you, you don't protect your food very well they just take it away and then go with it that's how they live here whilst the mona monkeys are friendly and get closer to humans the black and white colobus hardly gets closer to humans the mona monkeys these ones we call them mona monkeys. They are friendly monkeys. Mm -hmm. While the black and white are unfriendly ones, they are quite shy. When we come here, they won't get close to you as these mona, mona monkeys are on our shores here. They are unfriendly monkeys. They eat only leaves. They don't eat banana and those kind of fruits. These monkeys here are living in troops or families and are being governed by their respective male leaders. When you come inside the forest here too, the monkeys, they live in troops or in families. So those with here with us here right now are just one family or one troop of monkeys. Mm -hmm. And each troop has a territory they live on. Mm -hmm. So they will not cross their territory or their boundary to the other side of the forest. Because of that, each troop has their leader who lead, who lead them in terms of everything. So in case there is something going to happen there, that leader has a way to communicate with them. That's what we call the kakum. It's a kakum yajini kokonu. Mm -hmm. So in case they see anything strange, that leader will make that sound indicate that there is something going to happen there. Three years after their birth, the male monkeys are seen as matured bachelors and are sent away from the family to start their own lives. When they give birth to you and you're a male, when you grow up to three years, you cannot live here anymore because you cannot have two males living with the females in one family or one troop. So when the young male is up to three years, like you're saying, where does it move to? Yeah, so we have bachelor troop here, so therefore we have that oh, really? also here, yes. So if you are a male, you can also create your family, like going with the young females here to different you parts of the for forest. females and other families. Yes, and then, and then when you get them, them, you create your own family. family. Yes, into a different area. One of the features that is quite unique about the Bobbin Fema Monkey Sanctuary has to do with, you know, this monkey cemetery, which lies right behind me. You have monkeys uh, buried just as humans are done interestingly the first two priests you know who supervised this end were equally buried here as tradition uh, demands uh, we are taking you through why this community have decided to give their monkeys special burial services as uh, human beings do these monkeys that we see here they died when they died too we buried them like humans so we put the dead monkey inside the coffin, cover with a white calico, and pour libation on it by using shinap or kasapreko. So it's a responsibility for the priest, the fetish priest, to bury the monkey if they die. Whilst we bury them, we have their cemetery in the forest. Then there's this question I posed to him as to how these monkeys, you know, are seen after their death. Uh, don't they die in the various colonies uh, or forests as as we know and how do they get by by their bodies when they are about to die they will come to the village or they will die an opening place so that we can find them and bury they don't die in the deep forest no why because they want us to bury it so they will come to the village or they will die an opening place so now you may follow me to this part of the cemetery where um, I've seen a couple of, uh, you know, uh, graves or tombs for uh, monkeys that have, you know, passed on several years back. This one here, an uh, adult male Mona buried on the 3rd of, you know, September the year 2012. Right here I have another adult female, uh, you know, black and white colobus, uh, which was buried uh, in 2011. Third of October, we have them in 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 you know different days. Adult female Mona buried in 2012. Adult female Mona buried in 2013. Same here. So, uh, based on the type of the monkey, uh, you know they give it a barrier and then leave an inscription to let you know when this particular barrier uh, took place. Obviously, this is so so unique. We didn't find it anywhere except here. 
A bobbing female monkey sanctuary has over the years attracted tourists from within and outside the country and this has in diverse ways contributed to the socio-economic development of the twin community. Joseph Apiaje is the Bono East Regional Director of the Ghana Tourism Authority. He says there is a need to help preserve the forest reserve for many obvious reasons. This one because it is a sacred place. The forest has been preserved variety of medicinal trees and trees even now when we came here look at the environment serene environment so it is very very important for us to preserve this forest for future generation quite apart from that it brings in a lot of economic benefits to the community now when we came at least we bought banana some people will leave money here apart from the entry fee that they will pay. Some buys honey, yam, even charcoal and what have you, cashew, a lot of economic activities because of this sanctuary is booming here in Boabin Fema. Even though there are attempts to help upgrade the site into a much better status, with the World Bank recently putting up this structure, Mr. PRG tells me more needs to be done to help better the sanctuary. We were fortunate to have benefited from the World Bank's uh, gesture, if I may say so. And I think it is dear to our hearts. And these are some of the processes that we are doing to add value to the site, because we need to enhance the site so that it can compete with other sites. To the community folks, the terrible nature of the road network linking the community to other parts of the country is adversely affecting the progress of the sanctuary and the community at large. Our as a community, we do not get help from anywhere, not from government or any other end. So we are only looking up to God Almighty for His intervention. How about the numerous revelers who do visit the Bobin Fema Sanctuary? What has been their impression and what additions do they want to see during their next visits? And this is my first time in Ghana and we just visited this monkey sanctuary. Um, I have never met monkeys before, so this is a really cool experience and I've loved every minute of it so far. I really like here. Because I've met some animals that I've never seen besides zoo. And I've seen some trees and plants that don't grow in countries I've been to. And I really like it. I definitely want to come back with more people so that, like Sashka said, like more people can experience it. Because before I came, I knew like nothing about Ghana. And I think that more people should know what's here. I think if the government takes it upon themselves, to make tarred roots or quality roots here leading to the Bobbin Fema Monkey Sanctuary. It would be very better for the community as a whole to also experience the need of a beautiful environment. As we celebrate the Ghana month on joy, it is good to let you know that the Bobbin Fema Monkey Sanctuary is the only place in Africa where one can easily view and pet these beautiful types of monkeys within a community. And as Sabit, Joy News. Bobby Fima. Boy, uh, what they say, how time flies. Time flies when you're having fun. And uh, I hope it's been a lot of fun for you catching up with us uh, this morning over these four hours. But 
It's got to the time where we have to draw the curtains on the show. Today has been yours truly uh, throughout, but let's look forward to tomorrow and look forward to my blunt thoughts as uh, well. My name is Benjamin Akako. Thank you for watching. Up next, you know how we do. We'll be serving you Joy News Desk. You want to stay for that.